chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This isn't a story. This is the truth. And I'm recording it all so I never forget. There's parts I'd like to forget. Hell, most of it. But I can't let that happen. Because then I'd lose the good parts too. And those... are worth holding on to. My father was dying and had been dying for years. There's some specifics in there, but mostly he was just too goddamn old. He was bedridden by the time he was 91 and stayed that way. I thought he had died a decade ago when he had had a scare with his heart, but the old bastard kept on keeping on. We, we didn't talk much those last few years. We never had what you'd call a good relationship. He was already past middle age by the time me and my brothers were born, and we just never really got close to each other. Just too much time between us. So it was a shock when my phone started chirping away and his number popped up on the screen. I was an hour outside Knoxville, heading back home after dropping off a haul. I reached over and pressed the green icon, letting the hands-free system do its magic. At first, there was nothing, just the sound of his heavy breathing, neither of us wanting to speak first. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> Hello? His voice was raspy, but still had some strength behind it. Hello? Eli? Hey, Dad. Is everything all right? I need you to come home as soon as possible. Dad, listen. I've been on the road for ten hours already. I need some sleep. It's almost time, Eli. I ain't got too much longer. And I need to see you before I'm done. Both of y'all. I wanted to laugh but kept it to myself, mostly. Both of us. <laughs> no disrespect intended here, but there ain't no way in hell Luke is coming home. You know that, right? He'll come. He always listen to you. Convince him. I ain't even seen Luke in what, three, four years? Now you just want me to call him out of the blue? He will listen. I'll be waiting. Don't... Don't let me down, son. The line went dead, and he was gone. Shit. And that about summed the situation up. It was about seven in the evening by the time I got back to my place. Tired as shit, and needing a bath and a beer in any order. I parked my rig along the side of the house and stepped out into the night blade chill of the January air. I held my phone up in front of me, just staring at it, not wanting to dial the number. There was something blocking me from doing it, keeping my mind from making my hand move. Maybe it was the time between calls, maybe just embarrassment for not keeping in touch like family should. I don't know but it was hard as hell to make it happen. I finally convinced my shaky fingers to cooperate. It rang once, then twice, and by the third, I was hoping he wouldn't answer, but he did. His voice was thick with sleep. Uh, yeah? Who is it? It's me, <coughs> Eli. Eli? <coughs> hey, man. What's happening? Well, uh, I got a call. How's, uh, Janine? Jenny? The divorce was final two years ago. Oh. Oh, shit. Sorry, man. 
Not your fault. I wasn't around to tell you. You got a minute? This about the old man? He finally slipped off this mortal coil? Not yet, but he says it's happening soon. He wants us, both of us, to come tonight. But there came the unmistakable click of a lighter and a sharp inhale as Luke took a drag on a cigarette. Well, tonight's not so good for me. I got a sound check in a little bit, and there's even talk of a scout being there for the show. And I got a lady friend here who just might want me to hang around a bit. It's Nashville, Luke. There's always a scout around somewhere looking for guys to sign their souls away. Maybe, but I don't see any reason why I should drop everything I'm doing and ride off into the sunset. Because Dad... Fuck him! I haven't spoken a word to him in years, and I don't plan to now. An idea started to form. Well, maybe that's the problem right there. What? It's your chance. Tell the old bastard how you feel. Send him to his grave with an earful. <sighs> Fuck it. Not like I'm gonna make it into the will anyway. Okay, I'll go. But you're gonna have to give me a ride. I had to sell my car a while back. Fine. I can probably be there by 10, and that gets us back in Alabama around midnight. Text me your address and I'll call when I get close. Eli? Yeah? You think this is really it? You think he's finally giving up the ghost? Dad's voice wound through my mind. Yeah, I think this is it. I hung up, secured my rig, and jumped into my pickup the dread of the miles ahead weighing on me. Hours later, I pulled up to a slightly worse for wear duplex outside Nashville. The door opened as soon as I stopped and out strode Luke, a bag slung over his shoulder. The years had been kind to my baby brother. He still had a head full of long, dark hair and the beard of stubble that lent some authenticity to his whole starving artist thing. And just looking at the beautiful young lady waving to him from the doorway made me all too aware of the differences between me and Luke. Everybody has always been attracted to Luke, and I ain't talking about just physically. Folks were just drawn to him like iron filings on a magnet. He just had one of those faces, me, on the other hand, I mean, I don't think I'm no slouch or anything, but I was built for labor. Like I was made to plow fields and lift heavy shit, you know? And there's a reason why I was a linebacker in high school, and Luke took piano lessons, guitar lessons, and God knows what else. I don't even remember at this point. I got out and stood by the truck, unsure of what to do. But Luke made the decision for us, wrapping his arms around me in a fierce hug. He let go, but kept me at arm's length. You look good, man. I dig the beard. You look like a redneck viking. I couldn't help but smile. Fuck off. You're just jealous you can't grow it like this. <laughs> <laughs> and cover up this face? Hell no! Uh, you ready? No, but that ain't gonna stop us. All right, let's do it. We got in and started off. After a stop for caffeine and gas, we hit the road proper. Luke was relaxed, but I could tell this trip was already getting to him. Like the closer we got to Alabama, the more it weighed on him. I could tell he wanted to smoke, but didn't ask. He knew I hated that shit. I decided to keep the mood light. So how's it been going? Anything new? We dropped a new album about six months back. He paused to take a sip of his Red Bull. <sighs> Even got some radio play on the first single. Really? That's great. Yeah, it's been okay. Gigs have been steady at least. So, Regret No Choice is gonna be a household name soon, huh? He glanced at me. Raising one eyebrow. What? 
No. I left RNC like two years ago. Oh. Well, what's this new one called? Burn This Day. I shook my head. Seriously. What's with these metal bands and names that are phrases? I thought he'd get sullen, but he surprised me by laughing. I don't know, man. We all threw around names and that's the one that stuck. I don't even care as long as I'm on stage, you know? I didn't, though. I always kept my head down and kept working. Never really had the urge to be the center of attention. I nodded because I didn't know, but I understood what it meant to him. I'm sorry. I should have known that. It's cool. I ain't got my feelings hurt or anything. No, I know. It's just... I should have been around more. Hell, I could have at least called every once in the blue moon. You ain't the only one guilty of that, you know. I nodded. We had an understanding. Wasn't some huge emotional breakthrough, but yeah. It was an understanding. Sometimes that's all you need. We were silent for a while, and the blacktop stretched out before us. We made small talk. Time passed, and eventually the headlights lit a big green sign reading, Welcome to Sweet Home Alabama. Psst. More like bitter hell, Alabama. <laughs> yeah, I guess it can be sometimes. <laughs> I don't like this, Eli. I get it. I don't really want to be doing this either. He shook his head. I mean, it doesn't feel right. Why couldn't he just get on with it and die? Why drag us back here? Well, maybe he... I don't know. Maybe he's sorry for... for everything. Fuck that. He ain't sorry, and even if he was, I don't give a shit. He could make me sole heir to all his money, and I'd still spit in his face. Well, you do what you feel like you have to. I ain't gonna stop you. But at least make an attempt to listen. He may genuinely want to make amends. Even with my eyes on the road, I could still feel Luke's glare. His half-ass apology won't bring Jake back. And there it was. Jake's name dropping from Luke's lips and landing between us like a rock on a coffin lid. Luke, I know that. You don't think I know that? He was my brother, too. He didn't answer immediately, and when he did, his voice was flat. I know you know, but it's different, man. You're my brother, and that means a lot. But he was my twin. He was more than a brother. He was the other half of my soul. I felt my lips stiffen as I nodded. I know that too. I wasn't trying to say the old man was gonna make everything better, cause he can't. I was just saying you should keep your mind and ears open and shit. What? Missed our turn. Looked like it came out of nowhere. Gonna have to double back or take a side road. <laughs> Well, do whichever's gonna take longer. <laughs> as much as I'd like to, I think it's best we just get it over with. I got off at the next exit and pulled over to the shoulder of the road, then took my phone off the dash. Give me a sec, gonna check the GPS. I brought it up and refreshed the screen. The map was gray and blank, the only thing showing were the words GPS unavailable. Shit. What? No signal out here? No, I got a signal, but the GPS ain't picking us up. What about a map? In my rig, but not in here. I don't even know how to get back on the interstate from here. Damn, ain't you supposed to be the responsible one? Supposedly. Look, I'm gonna call the old man. I need to check in anyway, and he's the only person I know who would know where we are. Luke's mouth twisted in disgust. Whatever, man. I scrolled back through my calls and hit the old man's number. Harden Residence. Gerald speaking. Gerald was my father's caretaker, and had been for God knows how long. 
and he sounded just like I remembered them, his accent as thick as a hundred-year-old pine tree. Hey, Gerald, it's Eli. And Dad around? Mr. Harding is at rest right now. Damn, we're stuck out in... We? Is Luke with you? Yeah, Mr. Harding will be pleased. Where are you now? We passed the state line a while back and I missed our exit, which is crazy, because I could have sworn... I see. So you took the next exit then? Yeah, and I don't know where to go from here. Nothing looks familiar in the dark. Drive three miles south. Then look for Old Forest Road on your right. Follow it, and you'll be where you need to be in no time. Back at the interstate or what? I have to go, Eli. I have my nightly duties to get to. See you soon. That prick just hung up on me. No shock there. He tell you where we need to go? Yeah, I think. Gerald was as fucking opaque as ever. Opaque, huh? Better stop using fancy words, brother. Before people start thinking you're intelligent. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it felt good as hell to laugh. I pulled off the shoulder and got us back on the road. Old Forest Road emerged out of the dark tree line like it had been hiding, waiting to spring on some innocent travelers. The way was overgrown with heavy branches forming above it like an archway. That shit isn't ominous at all. <laughs> yeah, it almost looks fake, like a movie set. <laughs> I turned my truck onto the road, grimacing at the sound of the branches scraping and clawing over its roof. In no time, we were enveloped by the dark, trees standing like sentinels along both sides of the road. We drove along in silence for a long while, the headlights only showing more road ahead. Luke squirmed in his seat. Let's turn on some music or something. The quiet is just as bad as the dark. I turned the radio on and scanned through the FM stations. Nothing but static all across the board. I got the new Gravel Scalp album on my phone. I shook my head. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound like I'd like it. Luke spoke to me like he was talking to a recently thawed caveman. It's the biggest metal band in the world! Well, turn it over to AM. It's probably more your speed anyway. I'm only four years older than you, asshole. Yeah, but you act like it's 40. I sighed and switched the dial over to AM. A man's voice came over the airwaves. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So you see, brothers, the Lord does delight in sacrifice, does love the oily smoke that billows from the burning fat of rams, surely. He loves the hot sizzle of boiling blood, but he loves something else more. Obedience. Should have known. I reached to turn off the radio. The only thing on AM this time of night is Bible thumpers and conspiracy nuts. And it's usually a mix of both. Believe me, I've done enough night runs in the Bible Belt to know. Leave it. It's better than quiet. Besides, these guys crack me up sometimes when they really get going. Does he sound familiar to you? We live in the South. Everybody sounds familiar. Obedience is not slavery, brothers. Obedience is pure joy. It's giving of yourself fully to the will of God, so you don't have to worry anymore. Your pain will be in 
inconsequential. You will feel nothing but the need to serve, and in that you will find unbridled happiness. Horse shit. Sounds like bowing down to a dictator. <laughs> you lost your faith, Eli? I wouldn't have guessed that in a million years. I shrugged. Well, you know as well as I do, growing up here, you either follow along because everybody else is, or you open your eyes to the truth. What's the truth? That if there is a God, he would hate these hypocritical assholes. <laughs> Tests lying lips. Do you understand, brothers? Lies stain your lips like a whore's rouge. This guy's jumping all over the place. Okay, about enough of that. I thumbed the off button. Nothing happened, and the man's voice grew. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord God hath commanded you. Not funny. Luke pressed the button himself and got the same results. What is this shit? No idea. I was confused as hell. He was quoting from Luke. Okay, so? He's a radio preacher talking about the Bible. You got a biblical name. No. Something's weird here, Eli. Turn around. I can't. It's one lane with trees right up to the damn fenders. Why are you so spooked? It's just some Bible thumper, probably operating out of some church basement somewhere. Just stop for a second and look at me, okay? I slowed to a stop. The only sounds were the truck's engine and that weird hymn. I looked at Luke. His face was haggard and drawn. I know this will sound fucked up, but you start talking about the truth, he starts talking about lies, then he's on to Luke with barely anything in between, just spouting verses at us. It's not at us. I'm sure we ain't the only audience, even if it is late. Then why is he calling the audience brothers, no sisters, or children, or people, or even fucking y'all? I felt an odd turning in my guts. Not fear, exactly, but something off. Okay, all right, listen. As soon as we come across a place wide enough to turn around, I'll do it, okay? Luke nodded, relief softening his features. Okay, sorry. I just don't like it. I put the truck back in gear. Yeah, me neither. We drove along. The radio stayed on, the wordless hymn droning on, the preacher's voice blessedly absent. The tree line began to thin, and the road became wider. You got enough room now? I spotted something ahead of us. Hold on a sec. You said- Just hold on, okay? There was a bright spot ahead, and within seconds the headlights were reflecting off a dotted line. Look, Luke. Road. Real honest-to-God asphalt. We're through. Whew. About damn time. Sorry for the way I was acting back there. Oh, don't worry about it. It's just that I felt... Eli, look. He pointed, but I had already spied it. No other roads were led to it or away from it. Just the one we were on. The building was shockingly white, even in the dark, and its steeple rose up in a sharp spike from the ground. The belfry, a black rectangle. If there was a cross on top, then I couldn't see it. I had no idea how big or small it was. There were no wings or additions to either side, so any length it had was in the back. Two columns held up an awning, and between them was a set of red doors. A simple wooden sign stood in the grass to the left of the door. New Jerusalem Church of God, it read. 
The devil led him to Jerusalem. A twist of anxiety circled up my spine and I snapped at him. Knock that shit off, Luke. Don't grasp at things that ain't there. Please, Eli, get us out of here. I am, okay? Just hold on. I pulled into the empty parking lot and turned around, getting us back on the road. It was then that I knew the truth, and the truth was we were well and truly fucked. The road we came in on petered out into dirt, then dead-ended into the woods. No opening, no trail, just a wall of trees, like it had never been there in the first place. I stared at the place the road should have been for a long time. I don't know how long, but when I gained control of my wits, my mouth was dry and sticky with old spit, and Luke was shaking me by the shoulder. What? Sorry, I blinked for a minute there. You're just staring at the trees and mouth-breathing like a damn idiot. I shook my head. For a second there, for a second I couldn't look away. Like my mind kept trying to find the opening. Because it's supposed to be there. God damn it, it's supposed to be there. I know, man, I know. It doesn't make any sense. <sighs> We need to keep our heads on straight, okay? Luke nodded. Yeah, I know. I'm trying. All are lost, brothers. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is an answer. A way that all who are lost can be found. Join us for the service of the New Jerusalem Church of God. Join us, and all will be revealed. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Luke again. Of course it is. I turned to him. How do you remember all this shit? Mom, she read it to me a lot before, you know. Having Mom and Jake brought up in the same night was jarring. I hadn't thought about either of them in a long time. Consciously or not, I don't know. I'm going to find a way out of here, Luke. I don't know how yet, but we're getting out of here. In the rearview mirror, the lights on either side of the church's door came alive. Luke and I both turned to look at the same time. Looks like somebody's home. Fuck. I faced forward, gripped the wheel, and pressed the gas. I expected the screech of rubber on asphalt, but there was nothing but a few muffled clicks as the engine cut off. Eli, what are you doing? It ain't me. I twisted the key in the ignition with no results. I realized the truck was still in drive, so I slammed the gear shift up into park and tried again. Nothing. It's dead, Luke. Nothing's happening. Shit! Shit, shit, shit! We sat in the stillness for a moment, our heavy breathing the only noise. What are we going to do, Eli? I don't know. I just need a sec to think. I don't think you're going to get it. Look at the trees. The dual cones of the headlights lit up the tree line, and from between the branches and trunks came a fog black as death, darker than the night itself. Smoky tendrils snaked slowly across the ground, reaching up and out. The headlights began to dim. We gotta go. 
What? Where? This shit ain't just in front of us. Look around, it's coming from all sides. So what, the church? Fuck that. No fucking way. I don't see an option here, Luke. It's the only goddamn light out here. Come on. What the fuck? I pushed open the truck door and jumped out. Luke didn't move. I ran to his side and threw the door open. Come on, Luke. Luke still stared forward, shaking his head. The headlights were almost gone. Luke, get out of the goddamn truck or I'll pull you out and carry you. He got out, his jaw clenched and eyes wide. The ink black fog had reached the truck's bumper. Let's go. I pulled him by his jacket sleeve. Then we were running, darkness circling around us, leaking into the open air. I knew I could run faster, but I wouldn't leave him. I kept his pace, giving him a push when he faltered. (laughs) Almost there. The black was reaching around the corners of the church like crawling vines. The red door loomed ahead. My thoughts were pounding as much as my heart. A constant rhythm of almost, almost, almost. Luke tripped, going down hard, his head connecting with the concrete with a sickening thump. I cried out, not even words, just noise. I doubled back the few strides and grabbed him under his slack arms, heaving him up to my chest. I dragged him pushing myself backwards as fast as I dared. The fingers of dark caressed his boots. My back hit the door and it opened inward, our momentum sending us sprawling to the floor. I jumped up and slammed the door, then panicked as I realized Luke's feet were in the way, covered in a shroud of black. No, you don't, fucker! I grabbed a handful of Luke's jacket and pulled him out of the way. I slammed the door and the thread of black that had wound around Luke's feet was cut. What remained on our side of the door solidified, becoming something like a tentacle, but bristling with fine hairs like a spider's leg. I was reaching, ready to grab the shit and toss it away. But before I could, it loosened and shriveled, fading away as I watched. I knelt down beside Luke, gently lifting his head from the floor. His forehead was cut on one side. Blood ran slowly down into his hair. Luke, come on, man. You gotta wake up. What the fuck? Relief warmed me like a blanket fresh out of the dryer. You tripped, man. Got a nasty cut, too. Can you stand? He propped himself up on his elbows. I think so. Give me a hand. I offered my hand. He grabbed it and I pulled him up. He was unsteady for a second and I thought he had toppled, but he shook it off. I briefly worried if he had a concussion, but we had more pressing shit to attend to. Look at this goddamn place. I'd expected everything to be dark or at least lit by candles, but I was wrong. The main room was flooded with light, all regular electric bulbs. The walls were the sticky cream color of old bone, the carpet a deep red. The pews looked like they were crafted from white pine, their cloth pad in the same red of the carpet. It all looked new and antiseptic like those mega churches on TV. Luke surveyed the room. This is probably the least welcoming looking church I've ever stepped foot in. I nodded, chewing on my bottom lip, an old nervous habit. I didn't want to say what I was thinking, that it looked like we were inside something alive, something with blood and bone. I was thinking other things too things I didn't want to say out loud. I snapped out of it when I heard the doors rattling. 
Luke pulled on the handles, but they weren't moving an inch. No big surprises there. What's the plan then? Have a look around? Cuz, if that's what you're thinking then, I gotta say, that's an awful plan. Don't see that we have a whole hell of a lot of choices. Doors locked, and if you ain't noticed, there ain't any windows to speak of. He nodded slowly, then perked up and snapped his fingers. Call the old man. See if he can send somebody out. And there it was, just that quick, the thing I didn't want to speak. No, I... Look, even if somebody could get to us, they ain't getting through that oily shit coming out of the woods. Luke stared at me, his eyes boring into me like a drill. What ain't you saying, Eli? We ain't twins, but I know your face. And I know there's something you're keeping to yourself. I don't know, Luke. Maybe calling Dad ain't the best idea. Why? I thought about my next words carefully, trying my best not to sound crazy. There's no way I missed our turn, Luke. I didn't even see the exit till it was in the rear view. I've been up and down this stretch of interstate hundreds of times. Yeah, but you said yourself you were tired as shit. I wasn't asleep at the wheel. Shit, I was talking to you when it happened. I've been hauling freight of one kind or another for damn near 20 years, and it's been about that long since I missed an exit. Any exit. Okay, so what's it mean? I think it was hidden, like the road outside is now. We can't see it, we can't get to it. He looked thoughtful. You're probably right. I'm glad to hear it. I thought you were going to think it was crazy. Shit, I ain't about to discount anything about now. Especially with fucking crawling shadows coming out of the woods. That ain't the worst of it, though. I think we've been set up. Understanding made his eyebrows pop up. You think the old man did this? Why else are we here, man? He calls me up tells me to grab you and get down here as quick as shit. Then we get lost, and Gerald gives us directions right to the new bullshit Baptist church. I'm gonna fucking kill the old prick. Luke wrung his hands. If he's alive when we get out of here, I swear I'm gonna kill him. And I'd tell the cops I didn't see shit. But first we gotta get out of here. What's his game, Eli? You've talked to him more than I have the past ten years. Don't know, brother. To tell you the truth, I'm more worried about how he's doing it. The old bastard's rich. You can do a lot of shit when you're rich. True. All right, let's get moving. We moved down the aisle toward the altar, our footsteps muffled by the plush carpet. The podium was white pine, too standing up on top of a small set of stairs like an obelisk. Hanging above it was a life-size crucifix, a wooden Jesus pinned to it, his carved muscles straining, his veiny arms forever frozen in the act of pulling away from the nails. I looked into his face, anticipating the look of grand suffering there. But carved there was a rictus grin pushing his polished cheeks up against eyes that gleamed with dark humor. I swallowed hard, my throat dry and painful. A voice boomed over the unseen speakers. Servants! <laughs> Luke doubled over in pain, with his hands clamped tightly over his ears. Join us! That same tangled mess of a hymn started up again, trying to drown all thought out of my head. I spied a door to our left. I tapped Luke on the shoulder and pointed the way. He nodded and rushed to it. We both went through and he slammed it shut behind us. The music became faint, then was gone. We were in some kind of hall. Wood paneling stretched down the corridor, and tube lights ran the length of the ceiling. 
The end was far enough away that I couldn't see it. I nodded to Luke. He returned the gesture, and we began to walk. Every so often, I'd knock on the paneling, hoping I'd get a hollow thump in return. At some point, I broke the silence. I feel like we're being herded down a chute, like sheep to slaughter. That's what I need to hear right now. If you got any more motivational quotes, I'm all ears. Nah, I'll leave that to the old man. He always had some shit to spout, didn't he? Always keep one eye to tomorrow, and one eye on your back. <laughs> I was a little unnerved as my laughter echoed back at me from the hall. Yeah, he was a big fan of that one. He damn sure better watch his back now. I'm almost happy about this, you know? It finally got me off my ass, made me come down here and ruin the asshole. I know. After Jake died... After he went missing... I mean, yeah, went missing. You don't know if he's dead, Eli. Nobody knows. That's the whole fucking point. All of the old bastard's money and resources, and he didn't do shit. He could have had helicopters fly over the whole goddamn state 24 hours a day. Could have pulled some strings with his law enforcement buddies to canvas every square inch of the woods between Gulf Shores and Huntsville. But he did nothing. Not a damn thing but wait. And here we are, still waiting. I wanted to hug him, tell him everything was going to be okay, but I couldn't. I didn't want to make either of us uncomfortable, or at least that's what I told myself. Instead, I reached out and squeezed his shoulder. It was the best I could manage right then. We continued our trek, and I'd knock every couple of steps. Time passed, maybe ten minutes or so, and I was finally rewarded as one of my knocks reverberated behind the wall. Holy shit! You were right! How'd you know? I shrugged, then ran my hand over the spot. I didn't really, just hoped. Figured we'd been walking for half an hour with no goddamn door in sight that there may be more to this. Here, you grab the edge up high and I'll go low. Count to three and start pulling. We got into position, fingers dug into the slim crease where one wood panel met another. One, two, three. The panel came off so easily that we both fell on our asses. A cold breeze came out of the dark within, washing over us and making my skin break out into goosebumps. You think it leads underground or something? Luke stood slow, one hand on the wall for balance. I edged closer and peered in. I can't tell. I think there's a slope, but it's dark as shit. I don't think we should be traipsing around down there. But I also don't know what the hell else we're gonna do either. We just have to take it slow and easy. A sound was coming up from below. What the hell? Sounds like footsteps. Too fast. I took a step back. Something's running. The sound soon joined up with tremors, shaking the floor beneath our feet. The rows of tube lights overhead began to blink in and out with each shake, the intervals between light and dark getting shorter and shorter. Get back! I shoved Luke as far back as I could. The small hole we had made shattered into a hell of splintered wood as the thing busted through it. It struck me full in the chest and drove me into the opposite wall, and I could feel the panel in there crack with our weight. 
I only got glimpses of what it was as the light cycled off and on, creating bursts like lightning. My fingers scrabbled over its knobby skin as I searched for somewhere to grab and pushed the thing away from me. Its breath was in my face as it growled, cold and wet, leaving droplets I could feel running into my beard. I managed to find what I thought to be its neck and slid my hand beneath its chin, then pushed its face away from mine with a cry. The lights flashed, and I was pushing against my mother's chin, her skin pale. The bruise around her neck from the noose she had used was a livid purple in the fluorescent light. I screamed, and the blessed dark washed over us again. I was pressed back even further as Luke jumped onto its back. Let him go, motherfucker! The weight pushing me against the wall lessened as Luke steered the thing away from me. The lights flashed and Luke had both his arms around Jake's neck, the near-identical faces almost touching. The hall went dark again. The thing roared and I heard Luke hit the wall. I grabbed for him and my hands brushed his jacket. I lunged forward and got two handfuls and pulled. I hadn't realized where exactly we were until we were tumbling down the steep incline inside the tunnel. I tried to shield Luke as best I could, wrapping my arms and legs around him as we fell. That's all I remember before I hit my head and my lights went out. When I woke up, I was stiff, sore, and sitting upright. I shook my head to clear it, which was a god-awful dumb thing to do. It felt like my brain was loose and slamming against the sides of my skull. I slowly opened my eyes. I was sitting in a chair, my hands tied behind my back with what felt like some kind of soft cloth. The room around me was large and from what I could tell was shaped like an octagon. It was the same bone color as the church above, but carved deep into the wood were shapes and markings that made my eyes water to look at. One section was cut off from the rest by a curtain. Then I heard a voice from over my shoulder. Time to wake up. <sighs> Where's my brother? I watched as the man who spoke walked in front of me. Right here. <laughs> I looked up at him and was about to call him Luke, but realized that was wrong. It was Jake. He was the mirror image of Luke, true, but you had to know where to look. The two freckles under his left eye, the tiny scar on his bottom lip where he fell on the toy chest when we were kids. It was him, no question. Jake, what, what are you doing here? Jake grinned. Uh, you know, Ellie... A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Better question, what are you doing here? I tried to get my muddled thoughts together, but couldn't quite make it. I answered honestly. I don't know. Well, I'm not surprised. I blame it on the fact that you are always simple, but to be quite honest with you, this situation is definitely a tad complicated. I turned my head away from him and spotted Luke lying on the floor. Luke! Luke! Luke stirred and opened his eyes, at first just a little, then wider and wider as he saw Jake. What the fuck? Luke shook his head. Jake? Jesus Christ, Eli. 
I'm hallucinating. Jake walked over and knelt beside him. Afraid not, brother. I am very real. Luke's face changed, and it broke my heart to watch. His expression shifted from surprise and hope to outright fear within seconds. He pushed himself away, cringing against the wall. Eli, this ain't Jake, Eli. What the hell are you talking about? I don't know. That ain't Jake. Tears welled up in Luke's eyes. Oh, you know, if you could have just believed for a few goddamn minutes, it would have made all of this a lot easier. Now, we're going to have to bind you up to. Uh, don't bother. Gerald stepped out from behind the curtain, his slick silver hair gleaming in the light. I don't have it in me to bind another one. He'll be hey, won't you, Luke? Gerald drew the curtain back, the metal hook squealing against the rod. And there, laid up in the hospital bed, was my father. Tubes and wires hung between him and the machines keeping him alive. The vital signs monitor cast a greenish tint over his face, making him look worse than he already did. His small, dark eyes watched me. I knew it. I goddamn knew it. The old man slowly removed the breathing mask from his face. You've come home to serve your father and our God. Nice to meet you. It was then that I noticed Jake's teeth were white. Too white. I couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> I always wondered which was gonna go first, your mind or your body. But I guess this answers that. <laughs> oh, you don't believe your dear old dad? Here, let me show you something. He was fast. So fast I didn't see him move. One second he was in the middle of the room, and the next he was in front of me with his hands on either side of my face. He locked his eyes onto mine, and I, I went away. The room was gone, and I was nowhere, and it was dark. Jake's voice surrounded me. Look around, Ellie. This is outside. Outside of time outside everything. This is home. My home. Do you want a tour? <laughs> of course you do. I spun. Or at least it felt like spinning. Nothing was holding me. No gravity pinning me to anything. I was just floating in a black sea of nothing. Its waves lapping against some unseen object. See here? This is what you may call a wall, or a barrier, or anything else the pounds of salt and fat between your ears can come up with. But, if you just give it a little push... The blackness opened, and the light of ten thousand fires flooded in. I screamed at the shock of it, then stopped as I looked at what lay beyond the threshold. The land was the no color of ash, the sky baleful orange. Every surface was covered with people, vast crowds as far as I could see. Some walked in circles staring at nothing, making swirling patterns in the multitude. A woman walked by muttering questions I couldn't hear before a group leapt from the rest of the crowd and tore her apart with their nails and teeth and fists. Her blood seeped into the ash and was gone. I could see the bigger picture now, the random violence that erupted in clusters all over the land. Screams and curses rose up in a choir, and I tried to shut my eyes against it, but I didn't have eyes in that place. 
You know what their problem is? Boredom. Absolute boredom. It breeds frustration. And they kill each other over and over again just to feel something for a few brief moments. Even the excruciating process of being remade doesn't deter them. But even they have it better than me. The threshold collapsed. The dark retreated. And I was back in the room in front of Jake, sweating and sucking in deep breaths like I'd been drowning. <sighs> See? At least they have something. Wailing and gnashing their teeth and all that. But you saw what was in my home. Nothing. Always nothing. And that? That is exactly why we are all here. Was that... Was that hell? It was all I could say. You want the truth? I will absolutely tell you the 100% truth. But I promise, you're not going to like the answer. I nodded, numb and spent. Simple answer? No. What you call hell is much, much worse. Enough! Let's get on with it. On with what? Tell me. Don't you think I deserve that much, you prick? Out of the three of you, you've been the most dutiful. Very well, then. Do you know how old I am? I thought back. Ninety-three. No, son. I'm nearly three hundred years old. Though I forget the exact number. What the fuck are you talking about? The first time I was a young man, I made our fortune in the slave trade. I met many interesting people from all over the world. One of which introduced me to our smiling friend here. A deal was struck. He gets to stay here in human form, and I get to live for a very long time. I didn't want to believe a word of it, but I did. The things I'd already seen, yeah, I believed him. The old man continued. Every time I reach middle age, I marry. It's usually quite easy with my wealth. A ritual is performed and my wife becomes pregnant. And I have a firstborn son. Then you eventually twins. It has to be twins. It keeps me and our friend here connected. I've occasionally entertained the idea of having daughters, but if it's one thing my life has taught me, it's that it's much harder living as a woman. The firstborn, you, Eli, is a protector, strong and hardy to watch over your brothers, and to serve me. So you... What? Grew me? Knowing exactly how I'd turn out? Yes, as I said. As a protector. And when we force you from your body, it will become Gerald's vessel, so that he may continue to serve. Luke is my vessel. I will leave this frail flesh and live on in his body and identity. And I assume you can guess what becomes of the other vessel. The thing that was not Jake winked at me. And what if we say no? Dad's lips spread into a tired grin. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you want. You were born to serve, then pushed through the crucible made malleable and weak. Your whole production here was to make us weak? 
I shook my head. Untie me, and let's see how weak I am. Mr. Harden, sir, we really need to proceed. The old man spoke the Jake thing's name, and I shuddered. Amaros, it is time. Armaro stood before me again. Oh, it's not so bad, really. One second you'll be here, and the next you'll be somewhere else. Who can say where, really? But I can say, with absolute surety, that I don't give a shit. He held my face again, and I felt myself pulling away to... Well, somewhere else. Things began to go dark like before, but this time it was different. It felt final, and I knew it was over. I got tunnel vision as the dark ate at the edges of my sight. No! Don't touch them! Right before my vision gave out, I watched as Luke barreled into Armaros. With the connection broken, I was returning to as close to normal as I was gonna get in that godforsaken place. Luke was on top of the bastard wearing Jake's skin, both with their hands splayed on either side of each other's faces. There wasn't lightning or fire or any other supernatural light shows, but something was happening between them. They were stock still, as motionless as marble statues. Gerald ran toward them, arms stretched out. He placed his hands between the two like he was gonna pull them apart. And it was the last thing the uppity prick ever did. He fell back, convulsing, but still on his feet. Blood ran from his eyes, his ears, his mouth. He sprayed the shit everywhere as he screamed. I didn't look away as his skin peeled back and shriveled like jerky, and I still kept watching as pieces of him rained down to the carpet. And as the last of him tumbled down, whatever was holding my hands together loosened and fell away. I bolted upright, every instinct telling me to get to Luke, but one look at what was left of Gerald told me that may not be the best idea. I walked towards my father on numb feet. Eli, help me, and you could take Gerald's place by my side. We'll live forever. I'm sure you wonders, tell you all things I couldn't over the years. I reached his bedside. You know... I'm about goddamn sick of you talking. Always talking. Always twisting things to get your way. Whatever you want. It can be yours. Just say it. I tugged the pillow out from beneath his head. All I want is for you to shut the fuck up. I shoved the pillow over his face and pushed. He beat at my arms with his weak fists, dug his fingernails into the sleeves of my jacket. Didn't do him any good. I kept pushing till he stopped moving. I stepped back in a daze, the droning beep of the vital signs monitor filling my ears. Luke and not Jake hadn't moved the muscle, locked together, reflections in the mirror. The room began to shake, a deep thrum all around us, pulsing hard enough to knock me down. I put my hands over my head as Dad's IV pole fell over and bounced painfully off my elbow. Cracks began to run up the walls like lightning bolts. Luke! 
Come on, man, snap out of it. Everything began to collapse as I crawled toward them. The sound of the building shaking itself apart reached an ear-splitting crescendo. I squeezed my eyes shut, waiting for the first slab of earth to tumble down and crush me. I waited like that till I thought I'd sprained my goddamn eyelids. But the shaking stopped, and my skull was still in one piece. I cautiously opened my eyes. I was lying flat on the gaudy, overpriced rug in my father's bedroom. The tall curtains were closed, but slivers of the morning light still found their way through. Luke sat cross-legged in front of me, his eyes vacant. I propped myself up on one elbow and reached out to him. His eyes focused and he took my hand in his. What happened, Luke? Just what in the hell happened? I found Jake. The real Jake. He was still in there, Eli. A prisoner in his own body for ten years. There wasn't a lot left of him, to be honest. But he recognized me. And he helped me push that asshole out. My vision turned to prisms as tears welled up in my eyes. (laughs) Where is he now? Luke pinched the surface of the rug and brought up some dust or ash. I couldn't tell which. That's all that's left of his body. But he ain't a prisoner anymore. He moved on to somewhere. I don't know where, but he seemed happy about it. I squeezed his hand. (laughs) That's good then. That's all that matters. He's free and happy. Luke nodded, and his tears came as he broke into sobs. (laughs) I sat up and grabbed him around the shoulders and pulled him to me. We sat like that for a while, not talking, just being there for each other, just being brothers. Eventually, we got our wits about us and called the authorities about Dad. They collected his godforsaken carcass, and we both felt a hell of a lot better after that. We had a funeral a few days later, a big affair with all the trimmings. It's the South, and you gotta keep up appearances. Things have been pretty good since. About a week after the funeral, We got a visit from the old man's lawyers, and guess what? Luke was the sole beneficiary in dear old dad's will. He got the house, the money, everything dad was planning on keeping for himself after he took Luke's body. It took hours for them to explain all the different places he had money socked away, how it was invested, and loads of other shit I don't have the mind for. Luke says he's going to donate sacks full of cash to a bunch of shit Dad would hate. The NAACP, the ACLU, and some others that would really chap the bigoted bastard's ass. (laughs) We're going to sell the house and find a couple of places close to each other. I ain't going to let him out of my sight again. I don't know if it's the ritual, the urge to protect that was put in me while I was still in the wound but I don't think so. He's my family, the only one I got left, and I believe that means more than some bullshit magic spell. I know now that there are places after this one, places after we die. I don't know if I'll ever see Jake again, but at least I'll have all this recorded to remind me. Cause no matter how shitty it was, I don't want to forget. Because for a brief moment, he was there, and all of us were together again. I love you, Jake. I couldn't say the words while you were here, but I'm saying them now. I love you.
The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Mark 13, 25. It was getting late in the evening. That part of dusk where the last hangnail of sun gets swallowed by night, fading into perfect darkness. The stars appear across the sky, twinkling their cosmic beauty all over the people down below as they run through the streets for their lives. Jasmine stood in awe as both the moon and the sun fell to earth in the garden of the small city. Their cryptic smile showed upon the stampede that rushed by, as if sharing a private joke that only they were privy to. Jasmine ran through the crowd as they tore their way in every direction, threatening to trample her without a second thought. Most of the buildings that still stood were covered in flames that quickly spread to those that weren't. She ran over to one of the buildings standing and went up the wooden steps. The door was unlocked, and she slammed it shut behind her. She lay against it, breathing heavily while wiping the sweat from her face. She was surprised to see her family. Her older sister lay on the floor, much younger than she should have been, crying with her mother. Her father, who had died a grisly death from stomach cancer, worked an old television with a rotting fist yelling, shit, as he couldn't get anything else but static. If they noticed Jasmine, they didn't say. She was about to ask what was happening when the rumble began. Soft at first, but then the window started rattling. It grew until it shattered the glass, and everything that wasn't nailed down was toppled to the floor. Outside, a massive wall of flames stretched toward them, swallowing everybody on the street. Bright yellow filled the room as she backed up, and the walls imploded. She felt her body disintegrate into nothing, then woke up. Jasmine's dreams were always wild. Vivid and marvelous, her mother would say. The shock of them would always leave a big impression, but they were nothing new. Now in her thirties, she'd had them long enough that they were now inconsequential, like watching a movie. The dark scene replayed in her head for about an hour or so, then faded into nothing. The world was going to end. She already knew that. It was only a month ago since the asteroid made the news. All across social media, the story of the asteroid heading toward Earth was all anyone would talk about. It was first played off, scientists and other officials assuring the public that it would only be a near miss, or that it wasn't possibly big enough to do any real damage if it hit. She believed it, wanting desperately to believe it, as so many others did. The truth couldn't stay denied, though. A few amateur observers saw the truth and were heavily mocked for being conspiracy theorists and spreading misinformation. Others began to speak up. And soon, NASA was even confirming it. The President of the United States convened with all the other world leaders, and they tried to destroy it with a large arsenal of nuclear warheads. The explosion could be seen from the Earth, but it didn't even dent the monster. The only thing they accomplished was possibly speeding up everybody's death as radiation peppered back across the globe. Soon enough, everybody was sick from radiation poisoning, and most plant life withered. The final report that aired was a farewell message from the President of the United States. It more or less said so long that we had a good run. Make peace with your loved ones and yourselves, because it was game over. The asteroid was supposed to be bigger than the one that killed the dinosaurs and would probably destroy the Earth for good. The power cut out after that. Four days left. Jasmine crossed off the days like a gruesome advent calendar. The 23rd was circled in bright red. That was the day that the meteorite was supposed to destroy the world. It was visible during the day now. Just a speck in the sky. She did her best to avoid the windows and direct sunlight, as it worsened the burns from her radiation sickness. But she made it a point to look at its progress each morning. Most of the people in her apartment complex were gone. It was the way she preferred it, as people usually lead to problems and disappointment. There was still a handful, though, which she was thankful for, especially Chris. He was an older fellow who lived a few doors down. Even before the disaster, the two of them would get together once in a while for a game of cribbage. 
He was a sweet man with a great sense of humor. Although she thought about romance with him once or twice, neither really wanted anything more than to skunk with each other if they were lucky enough that day. They would toss a few beers back while playing, and Bonnie, his German shepherd, would periodically come by to give a lick to her hand or see if either had a scrap of food to spare. A family of three lived across the hall close to the stairs, the Coleman's. Edward and Michelle were a married couple that seemed to argue over anything. It was usually this arguing that would break Jasmine from her strange dreams. She felt bad for their son, Nathan. He was a bright nine-year-old who always looked much sadder than boys his age should. There was nobody in his generational bracket around anymore. Whenever his parents caught Jasmine trying to talk to him, they would hurry him inside while shooting her a dirty look. Old Mrs. Breyer lived next to the family. She was a quiet, older woman that usually kept to herself. It seemed like everyone did these days. Chris once told her that both her husband and her kids died in a bad car accident. He was drinking and must have overcorrected, sending the car off a small cliff. She always blamed herself, and her mind began slipping after the years. There used to be a nurse that came by in the mornings and evenings. As the weeks went by, Jasmine could only assume she was one of the people that left town. She wasn't sure why people left. Maybe they thought it couldn't get them that far up. Like some magical force would protect them from the fall of radioactive dust. Or they could get just far enough away to be safe from the impact of the monster in the sky. It frustrated her. But she knew how powerful denial could be. After all, she denied her family most of her life. There wasn't much of a story there. Her parents split up when she and her sister were young, and neither wanted them. So, over time while growing up with a foster family, she grew to resent them. Food was becoming scarce. Most of the places around them had already been looted, and stepping outside would mean drastically accelerating their sickness. So Jasmine, Chris, and sweet Mrs. Briar pulled what they had left and rationed it out each night. The Coleman's, of course, snubbed their offer. When they finished a buttered bread and chips meal, Jasmine made her way over to Chris's. Before long, she was losing her third game of cribbage against him, gently scratching Bonnie's tummy. Even the dog was in poor shape, as more patches of fur came off each day, exposing bright pink skin below. Chris said abruptly. Part of her wanted to be shocked, but she knew how much Bonnie meant to him. She must have been suffering so badly because of it. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's such a cruel way to go out. For all of us. Baked to a crisp in our skin. And bam. Hit over the head by a giant rock. Jasmine considered this while looking over her cards. She found it incredible that after all these years of playing, and with the apocalypse knocking at the door, she could still get excited over a good hand three fives and a jack. Then she scoffed, trying to push her sister from her mind. You gotta have friends to spend time with them, and family is a joke. Pretty much everyone that I knew before moving out here was already gone. Yeah, I guess. Maybe I'd get loaded every night and eat until my ass jiggled. She laughed. Her smile turned into a frown when she saw the cut card was a seven. What would you do? Chris sighed and put his finger over the top of his lip. He often did this when he was deep in thought. He said, giving her an ear scratch. She wanted to argue for him, to show him the good in all of it. But there wasn't much point. He was effectively correct. He spoke again, throwing two cards to her crib. He said this with a warm smile. As he pets Bonnie's head, more fur comes away in his hands. Jasmine could see the pain in his eyes. It was heartbreaking. Well, we still got time. Maybe we should go to an airport and go for a ride. She said with a smirk. Chris chuckled and they continued their game. Jasmine losing by 64 points. It was still early in the evening when Jasmine went home. It seems she, along with everyone else, slept more these days. The sickness that ran its course took a lot out of them. Not that there was much else to do. 
The water no longer worked, but it was so contaminated that it would have been a death sentence to use. So a shower was out of the question. She settled for just removing her clothes and flopping onto the bed. She was close to drifting off when she heard the angry screaming coming from down the hall. It was Mrs. Briar. Frustrated, she threw her dirty, blood-spotted clothes back on and went to the hall. The door to Mrs. Briar's apartment was wide open. She made her way over to it, then poked her head in. Mrs. Briar? She moved further inside, stunned to see a man she didn't recognize standing over the terrified older woman. The man had been living outside in the city. The skin on his face was mostly gone, leaving only a mask of brown, dried-up, leathery meat. Jasmine wasn't even entirely sure he could blink still. He was on her in a flash, squeezing a tight hand around the back of her neck. The tip of a long knife rested against the woman's red skin, and Jasmine began to backpedal. At this, she jumped, yelping in both fear and pain. No, please. What do you want? Jasmine nodded as his crazed eyes took her in. When he talked, she could see several teeth were missing. They were an ugly yellow, and the muscle that somehow managed to encase them was an angry shade of red that seemed to be slowly burning toward them. She thought of her teeth that started to become loose last week, and it scared her. No one was going to be spared. He growled, pointing the blade to Mrs. Briar again. No, please. My apartment's this way. She yelled, pulling him back from his coat. You can take every bottle that I have, okay? Nobody has to get hurt. She was crying and amazed by it. After all this time, she still didn't want to die. Or Mrs. Briar. He nodded at this, and the two slowly made their way back to Jasmine's door. As she walked through, a loud gasp shot out from behind her. She turned her head, and Chris was standing there holding a rolling pin that dripped with blood. The man lay on the floor, and a nasty wound on the back of his scalp leaked what little blood still pumped from inside his body. With a roar, he slammed the pin down on his skull repeatedly. No, Chris! She pleaded. She turned away as he continued raining down blows. Sharp cracks turned into wet thumps until he was sure the man didn't feel a thing. Somewhere in the city, possibly the next building over, was a little girl who would die a sad death. She entered her apartment and locked the door, where she cried deep into the night of sleep. Jasmine was running down the street she grew up on. Ahead of her, a field of skeletons stood in her direction. All of them are pointing toward her, jaws open in a noiseless scream. She quickly looked behind her to see a great ball of fire and smoke dropping from the sky. She ran faster as she felt the earth begin to shake. Then the behemoth touched down. Even as she continued to pump her legs, she was lifted into the air along with the skeletons. Their screams became audible as they joined hers in a grim chorus. The first thing that hit her was the nausea. It quickly rose from the depths of her stomach and she hurled up last night's meager meal. The next thing she noticed was how badly it hurt. It was as though she swallowed a lump of glowing coal that made its permanent home in her core. After a few more dry heaves, she was shocked to see how much blood was on the carpet. Her sickness was getting worse. At this rate, the radiation might seal the deal before the asteroid. She groaned as she got out of bed. Everything hurt. The glistening blisters on her unnaturally red skin had gotten bigger. She stumbled out to the hall and was surprised that she didn't hear the Coleman's. Maybe they finally worked it out, she decided. When the Coleman's door opened, she was going toward Mrs. Briars to see how she was holding up after last night. Chris stepped out, looking surprised to see Jasmine. He looked about as bad as she felt as blood seemed to paint his face and arms. Chris, what's going on? What happened? He sighed deeply. Jasmine's eyes widened at this. What? How? I know they were sick, but all three in one night? She felt her tears well up and brought her hands to her face. Chris walked over and put his arms around her. She took hold of him and sobbed quietly into his shoulder. 
As the moments ticked by, the door to Mrs. Briar softly opened. She walked out wearing a robe, covered in a mess of red, and crept up behind him. Neither of them saw the knife lash out. The very same knife the man from last night dropped. With startling quickness for a woman her age, she dug the blade deep into his ribs while raving like a banshee, twisting the knife back and forth. You'll thank me later, dear, she said, nodding. Once again, she reached back, and as the blade came forward, Jasmine shoved her against the guardrails of the steps. The once sweet older woman screamed as she tumbled down the stairs below. It would have been a relief if she died there. But she lay at the bottom, howling at the jagged piece of railing that pinned her to the fourth step up. Jasmine went to Chris, putting her hand on his wound. It was wide and blood seemed to pour between her fingers. He yelled as the two of them struggled to their feet. They made their way over to his apartment, and she sat him down at the table they played cards at so many times together. She rifled through his bathroom for a first aid supplies and returned with alcohol and gauze. As she poured the stinging liquid, he screamed so loud it made Bonnie howl in tandem. She hadn't seen Bonnie until now. And she really wished she hadn't. There was barely any fur on the poor animal, and bloody bits of her bowel trailed from her bottom. It was clear that none of them were. She wasn't going to last much longer. She busied herself with Chris and pressed the gauze firmly against his wound. Taping it up, she gave Chris a sad smile. Jasmine giggled despite her urge to cry. Tears burned a lot more today, she noticed. Fresh out, I'm afraid. There's only two left, she called from the kitchen. I can go out and try and find more. She quickly grabbed the cards and set up the board. Then the two played cribbage for the rest of the day. That night, Jasmine stayed with Chris at his apartment. Mrs. Briar shouted off and on, but Jasmine couldn't bring herself to go out there. Before long, she was in a faraway land where everything appeared in a Renaissance painting. Men with shining armor rode upon mighty horses. They were off to slay some fantastical beast. When up in the sky, a large diamond star fell to the earth. When it touched down upon the mottled ground, it sent men and horses alike off in every direction, setting them ablaze. Flames spread out and quickly ate through the picturesque setting, consuming everything until there was only darkness and the scent of death. When she opened her eyes, she felt her skin was wet and slick. Blood was now beating out of the wounds that grew upon her burning skin, and the smell was putrid. She cried as she struggled to get to her feet and looked around. She didn't see Chris or Bonnie anywhere. A small trail of blood most likely left by Bonnie led out the door. She followed it out to the hallway, noticing that the smell of death was more pungent. Mrs. Briar was silent and would be forevermore. The trail of gore continued to the rooftop, and she opened the door where she saw the two sitting on the ledge. Chris, what are you doing? Get back in here, she yelled, knowing how much worse the radiation levels were out in the open. He didn't respond, only waved a hand back toward her. She briefly considered going back in, but what was the point now? The pinprick in the sky was much larger now, like a tiny moon in the morning sky. The sunlight made her already fiery skin burn even hotter. But she walked out toward her old friend. Chris? He replied, half turning to her. Oh my god, Chris! She cried. His exposed face and arms had the appearance of a rotting corpse. His nose, ears, and lips were mostly gone and as he tried vainly to pet his dog. It was apparent he was now blind. Bonnie was just as bad. How long have you been up here? He chuckled painfully. Before she had time to react, he leaned his ruined body forward and went off the side of the roof. He pulled Bonnie with him, and she heard the sickening thuds below. She couldn't bear to look and ran back to her apartment. Now the only person left. Her condition was already bad, but her time on the roof did her no favors. 
She slept off and on the rest of the day thinking about Chris. She thought about her neighbors and how she would never see anyone again. She thought about the man who would kill just to get his daughter some water. Then she thought about her own family. She found that as much as she denied them in her life and tried to block them out, she missed them deeply and wanted nothing more than to be with them one last time. Mercifully, no dreams haunted her that night. She had to unstick the blanket from her skin when she awoke on the final day. A froth of blood and flesh coated her bedding, and her scream was weak as she sat up. Outside, the tempest of wind was savagely blowing, sending large pieces of debris throughout the city. The end was finally here, and she was alone. As she struggled to make her way to the hall, something in her stomach gave out. Blood began to seep down her legs, and she found she no longer had the ability to throw up. She continued her way to the rooftop, her wet, sticky feet slapping against the floor with every agonizing step. Throwing the door open, she was met with a gray, cloudy sky. The wind was of hurricane proportions, and off in the distant horizon, the great, burning harbinger of death filled the sky, blocking out the sun. It was larger than she could have ever dreamed of, and so close she felt she could almost reach out and touch it. She shakily sat down on the ledge where she last talked to Chris. Jasmine wasn't going to take the easy way out. She spent too long fighting on giving in to this monster. The wind grew even stronger, but she sat there smiling, thinking of all the loved ones she'd soon see again. Light filled her vision as a great roar ripped away all sound. The earth gave a teeth-jarring shake as it touched down. At least I won't be alone now, was her final thought before heading into oblivion. As he often did, Baxter found himself wandering the lazy back alleys of London as the light dwindled from opposite the Thames. The East End called to him at sunset, fond as he was of its odious revelry, the raucous tension between angry drunks, the sweetly sick sweat radiating off of young lovers. These dens of sin and wonderment were quite a world apart from his own home, the West End with its drawl yet floral small talk. Everybody trimmed like the hedges and perfumed as fragrant teas, although wandering eyes landed on Baxter's visage, as out of place as he looked. He never quite felt so invisible as in the lowly city quarters. Perhaps it was the lack of his fellow class. Not once had he run into an acquaintance so deep inside the twisted guts of these labyrinthian streets. That particular afternoon would bring with it many obscurities and surprises, not least of which was an unlikely meeting with an old friend. Baxter had been preparing to hail a hansom before the twilight ran to the darkest night. Just then, he spied a somewhat emaciated man of roughly his same age, confronted by two large ruffians demanding payment for an overdue drinking tab. The slight fellow pleaded, offering future payments guaranteeing more than what was owed, but the thugs wisely refused. The man retrieved a most beautiful and rare edition of On the Origin of Species from his rucksack, a hotly debated and revered title since its publication some years ago. Baxter was aghast at losing such a treasure and intervened to pay off the measly debt, a debt of much less value than the tome proffered by that poor and wretched man. A man Baxter began to realize that he recognized, though just barely. The man he had known had been stately and fit, a truly brilliant mind with sharp features to accent. The man before him was ghastly slim, haunched in posture, 
and wrinkled at the edges of sunken and darkened eyes, piercing eyes that still held a soft glimmer of genius. Edmund? Edmund Chambers. Well, imagine that. It's me, old friend Hurst. Baxter Hurst. Good God, Chambers. Whatever are you doing here associating with foul beasts such as those? Last I heard you had left on an expedition for an orchid dealer. Which one was it? Hargrove, I believe. Lots of money in orchids, I should know. Baxter winked. Oh, Baxter. It's good to see a friendly face in these unfriendly times. Yes, I've been on an expedition in association with Hargrove. I returned not long ago. I'm sorry to say that Hargrove has disappeared, and the compensation for my efforts in the New World. I am embarrassed to admit that I returned somewhat worse for wear, old friend. I've nothing to return for your kindness, and, and I apologize that you've seen me in such a state. Baxter scratched his chin. How ghastly, though I'd heard rumors of the man's proclivity for betting the races if you catch my meaning. I'd never take him for one to run out on debts, though, if anything is possible. I'm sorry for your predicament, and I'm more than happy to help a college chum in hard times. Better that you keep that beautiful volume of yours than for me to lose a pittance. I've come into my father's estate, you see. He passed away two years ago. I'm deeply sorry to hear that. Oh, think nothing of it. He was a wretched older man. The family fortune will be all the better for being handled by myself. In fact, I've joined in cooperation with a trading company. It's all rather uh, out of my expertise, but you Chambers, you've been to the New World and all that. Come, I'll hail a handsome. We can retire to my reading room. I'd appreciate if you would entertain me with the stories of your adventures. Adventure, Baxter, is not exactly what I found. But rather a terror may not be what you want to hear. But if you offer me brandy in a spot by your fire for a few of the coldest night hours, then who am I to refuse you? A terror, you say? Well, my interest is piqued all the greater. It pained Baxter to see a man of Edmund's grooming and pedigree sink so low into the gutter. He decided to try to help the fellow regain some of his dignity. He offered. And if the story of your exploits and the information gathered within can help my newly minted ambitions, you may find yourself with a bit more than a belly full of brandy and a warm seat upon which to rock. Edmund raised an eyebrow. Indeed, Hurst, I shall accompany you. I'm afraid I've no money for a hansom. Nonsense, Edmund. I'll not hear any more troubles presently. Baxter hailed a hansom and the two returned to the West End, as unlikely a pair as the driver had ever seen, a refined gentleman, and a flea-bitten boozer bantering like old friends. Baxter poured two brandies while Edmund coaxed himself into a large antique leather chair facing the fire. The firelight licked his face, puddles of illumination exaggerated his wrinkles, and deep shadows lengthened his already sharp features. He warmly welcomed the brandy. And Baxter had filled a second glass before Edmund started to tell his tale. I hope you'll allow me to explain myself in full, as I'm sure you'll recall from our time in university, though the name Chambers is well known in social circles. My family's wealth has dwindled over two generations of idleness. I was to inherit title alone. No fortunes beyond my creation. Naturalism was what I fancied, and what a time to pursue it. Darwin changed everything when I was a boy. The field had been revitalized. We were absolutely flooded with new information and fresh ideas back then. I had become particularly interested in the Amazon rainforest, scouring accounts from other naturalists. I stumbled upon the obscure journal of a German naturalist named Friedrich. In it, he had detailed the oddest behaviors I had ever read of, ants that could organize into complex geometric shapes, amphibians that hunted in packs, and then evidence 
of material culture in lower intelligence mammals. Well, the man himself had found it too difficult to believe and hadn't published any findings from that region. I knew of another naturalist, a Londoner, who had trekked an expedition that would have led through the adjacent territory to Friedrich, and I sought him out at his office. The man was of great help, and explained having witnessed strange behaviours in fauna as well, though he had written it off as a fancy of imagination, being that he had contracted malaria at the time. His account had set in stone the trajectory of my mission. I now had two points of reference, but there would be no hope of defining the boundaries of the queer territory I sought without a third. The third account I found but not in the journals of a fellow naturalist, but rather in the account of a wealthy hunter. His fortune had been hard made through international trade. The man was an absolute explorer and exploiter. He had come to the area of that Amazon, witnessed the most bizarre behaviours in fauna, planned to make a game of them. Yet the man explained being overcome by some hallucinogenic episode that had changed his opinion on the matter. His account had been found in a personal diary after his death, was given little notice at auction. This third account held coordinates far and away apart from the other two, beginning to define a boundary of strangeness deep in the Amazon. At this time, it had also become clear that the university had no interest in my inquiries. They had only offered a professional position at the price of giving up my field research. I held no interest in their proposal. No interest at all. To be sure, being stuck in a classroom during daylight, whilst my dreams flew me to the new world at night would have been torture. I found myself quite without recourse, and functioning on borrowed money from my father, who also lived off the lending. I scoured more libraries. I interviewed hunters and adventure seekers, often with fantastic stories, but there were ultimately exaggerations with which to puff out their chest or fevered dreams from malarial infection. In the end, could have sat and wait. The information which I had sought came to me in due time, delivered, in fact, right to my doorstep. Having quickly gambled away his father's fortune, Hunter's heir knocked on my door, inquiring if I'd like to purchase any more of his father's notes, journals, and diaries. It's quite sad, and I'm ashamed to say that I took advantage of the poor boy because I had no money to purchase anything. I asked if I might inspect the tomes first to assess their value beforehand, and he agreed. He led me to his home. I rummaged through the old journals. It's quite simple to find my prize. The hunter had been fastidious in his note-taking, everything chronologically ordered. In this, I had found not a collection of notes regarding the fauna of that mysterious jungle area, but rather its flora. The plant life of the Amazon, as you know, is spectacular and fascinating in its plethora of size, shape, color, and scent. The flora described by the hunter had yet odder features, for which I could find no explanation. There were plants with colored patterns that resembled human faces. Of what use to a flower is a human face? More importantly, it illustrated and described a subspecies of orchids that was quite out of the ordinary, with fabulous colors and luminescent striations. I quietly ripped the page from the diary, and I apologized. I would not be purchasing the book. It was then that I had set upon Hargrove with my proposition. All resources would be provided by Hargrove, including scientific equipment not associated with hunting orchids. After all, I was more interested in publishing a, a paper detailing this unexplored area, and a large sum if we successfully returned with 
a living sample of the mysterious glowing orchid. I be accompanied by two of Hargo's men. Two orchid hunters whom I would be surprised by nothing. Dangerous men, no doubt. Casper, a mountain fellow with hardly detectable Bavarian accent and a taste for raw fish, was the younger of the two. The other, Randall Blackwood, lean man, dark eyes, one finger missing from each hand, often surprised me. His quick-witted good humor and violent mood shifts often ended in verbal and physical fights between himself and the shipping crew until Casper would intervene. I grew somewhat fearful of my traveling companions on the journey overseas. But in a jungle filled with large predators and political instability, perhaps it was best that my comrades be fearful predators themselves. Ah. Once we landed, we would be taken by riverboat deep into the jungle, so far as the canals could take us towards our destination. I finally made it to the Amazon. I'd only ever dreamed of it until then. Dreams did not do it justice. The diversity of flora and fauna were incredible. Surely here are we seeing the beating heart of our planet. The heat was incredible. The air heavy and wet. And the bloody bugs. Baxter! Big as field mice! Constantly on the hunt! We slept with nets strung up around us. Otherwise, we'd surely been drained of our blood overnight. I was in heaven, Baxter. But heaven can often be miserable. The jungle is never quiet. It's a constant symphony of life and death. Birds call, monkeys cackle, violent shrieks of pleasure from mating, and blood-curdling screams from a jaguar's prey all mixes together into a wave of sound that never ends. Our riverboat captain was a friendly sort, had a taste for liquor and an ear for music, and early evenings were filled with his sultry guitar, as sure as my cup was filled with a guardiente. It was a pity to leave the jolly fellow and continue on foot with Casper and Blackwood alone. The journey was difficult. I despaired, how much more so than I had anticipated. Before long, though, our efforts were rewarded as I started to notice a distinct change in the environment. Began with small things, queer flowers that grew out of Fibonacci's order and moss that developed right angles. It, of course, could have been a mere coincidence. The jungle so vast, full of life. I briefly thought that perhaps I'd witnessed nothing more than a natural anomaly. Until the incident with the bioluminescent beetles. The glowing beetles were nothing new of note. There is much bioluminescent life in the rainforest. It was their behavior that was so queer. The beetles flew in unison, massing themselves into different shapes before illuminating. Perfect sphere, a pyramid, and another shape. A shape I'm afraid I can't articulate past this. Appeared to be a cube, but it occupied several positions in space and time simultaneously, without overlapping. I had to confer with Casper that I was not gripped by hallucination. He too saw what I had seen, and our resolve to push forward grew deeper. It wasn't long before we descended into the region I had mapped out. Untouched land as we knew it. Though we were wrong, there was a native tribe that lived in the region. They took us quite by surprise but welcomed us to their small community openly. Despite our language barrier, Blackwood despised all rainforest natives. As soon as I felt confident in my safety around the village, I sent Blackwood and Casper to retrieve more supplies from Belem while I conducted my research. 
The people there, though, kind, had a queer ways about them. They performed regular rituals. Though they never consumed alcohol, I could swear that I had occasionally espied them drunk. They had a material culture. Their art was actually quite sophisticated and resembled in its intricacy the Mandelas of India. Though the native art here was far more organic and exacting in its imperfection, as far as I could tell, they had no leaders. Shared work equally. An egalitarian society. I learned a great deal from them. Was better suited to living in the jungle before long. Their food was exceptional. Everything had a distinctively earthy sweetness and was intoxicating in some small sum. It's difficult to explain, Baxter, but I could swear that we could understand each other after sharing a meal more easily, conveying ideas without even saying a word. Spent many days trekking into the jungle around the village. I recorded much strange behavior. Animals exhibited incredible intelligence. Perhaps you won't believe me, but I witnessed ants en masse using tools. They stripped the bark from wood, chewing away until it reached its desired shape, then used the blasted thing to drain excess rainfall from their nesting mounds. I saw small monkeys dancing in synchronization in the artist's most intri intricate patterns. I witnessed wild boars chanting in unison, Baxter. I swear it. It was long before I found the orchid from Hunter's diary and more beyond. The flora was superbly unique, and I fancied the fortune I'd gain from its discovery. While the locals, the locals exhibited advanced art and culture and science as well. I noticed a curious mechanism on the riverbank. When in use, it was constantly attended to by a member of the tribe. They would always be chewing the same purple leaf. Once I gained their trust, then let me explore the village more freely. I examined the mechanism. It was a centrifuge, certainly. The river flow powered it, and the attendant controlled the speed by adjusting a turn screw. It was spinning a mix of river water and dirt, separating into the baser elements through centrifugal force. Their work was so accurate that the centrifuge would stabilize at incredible velocity. I yet to learn the purpose of the substance they extracted, but they treated it with the utmost reverence. I'd now been with the tribe for one and one half months. We had grown accustomed to one another, even though they'd never even learned my name. Come to think of it, I'm not sure they use names. At least not how we use names. Perhaps you'll come to understand my meaning in time. Well, everything came to a climax on the day of the eclipse. I awoke from tremulous dreams. When I left my small covered lean-to in the morning, it was through a spectacular array of art raised throughout the village. They all came together and prepared the substance from the centrifuge into food and drink. Before long, they all imbibed. A strangest sight I never saw. They fell into a trance. Barking and, and howling and twirling and crying and undulating. All is one. It was like witnessing the luminescent beetles. They all seem connected by some central spirit that can torture them into hitherto unseen formations. Their bellows in the singular, human, but altogether hissed like air escaping the throat of some incredible colossus. All the while, 
the moon inch closer to eclipsing the sun. I was confused, as there should not have been a full eclipse on that day, or any day for the next few years. Once the eclipse was in full, the throng changed direction. Three members of the tribe, a woman and two men, stopped and began to stare at the eclipse. The rest moved up, held the trio's faces in place, preventing them from looking away. I was frantic, trying to get them to stop, explaining through gesticulation that they would certainly go blind. A few of the tribe restrained me, brought the strange substance and forced it down my throat. Baxter, I'm afraid words shall never suffice in describing what I experienced then. The world that I know, reality, was torn asunder. I witnessed the vastness of the cosmos expand before me. I knew my comrades here. The language was no longer necessary. We had something deeper than language. We had an undertaking. I writhed and shrieked and shook in tandem, with the writhing and shaking and shrieking. I was reduced to myself and created again. I perceived science beyond my wildest dreams. More versions of existence, and how juvenile our understanding of the natural world is, Baxter. Then they allowed me a brief glimpse at the eclipse. A terrible understanding seized me. I saw the Emperor Worm, the placated King and slumbering Colossus, beautiful and terrible both, lying beneath our feet, and I felt its constant pain at being trapped here, in this, our version of reality. I pitied and feared the great and ancient God. But my eyes were torn from its sight before long, for I was not chosen to see. I spoke without thinking, found myself conversing freely in the tongue of the natives. Either I had learned it instantly, or perhaps I spoke my English and they spoke their language, and our understanding of one another came from a deeper well than the catalogue of mouth noises that give basis to language. This was a pure communication. I wondered if they had always understood me. I was the fool, a student surrounded by teachers, pretending to be a scientist. The eclipse passed, but the influence of the hallucinogen did not. The three chosen were released. Indeed, all three had gone blind by normal medical standards. It was explained to me that they now saw the Emperor Worm always, and he saw through them the visions I briefly experienced with the Eclipse would be forever burned into their eyes, and the Worm would use the sight they sacrificed his eyes to see, even in its slumber. The placated king requires eyes. Must always see the world that protects its coma. It's a terrible price and an incredible sacrifice for these people. And it's the only thing that keeps him from waking in a fit of terrible anger and descending the world into a never-ending nightmare. A sleep provides great bounties in its comfort. Why, the very soil is thick with its excretions from its long and wet breaths. It's the very thing that stimulates such queer adaptations in the flora that grow in the area, and the odd behaviors in the fauna that lay higher up the food chain. See, the centrifuge separated the substance, the worm's gift, and it was further purified before being imbibed. 
We spoke without words deep into the night. I had come with an intent to exploit. But now I felt that the area needed protection. This was no mere haven of unusual orchids. I rested easily that night, but awoke most frightfully. Casper and Blackwood had returned, but in pieces. Having been decapitated somewhere outside the village, and never found out by whom or what. If the villagers had suspected their motives, or if the very jungle had glimpsed my mind through the eclipse and protected itself, I dared not stay to discover. Rather, I fled, with no time even to pack. The months it took to return to civilization took much from me, Baxter. Thankfully, my time in the village had prepared me in so much as survival, but without money, credentials, or the company of Hargrove's men known in the area, my last resort was to stow away on a returning trading vessel, drinking rainwater, catching rats for food. I apologize for the vulgarity of my circumstance, Baxter. I do not wish to sicken you. I returned starved, penniless and without recourse, as Hargrove had mysteriously disappeared. I did not want my friends and acquaintances to see me in such a state, so I fled to the East End and drowned myself in cheap liquors. And so, you found me. Good God, Chambers! This is a lot to take in, gasped Baxter. Let me fix another set of drinks, old friend. It may help your mind settle. Edmund poured more brandy and returned with two cups, one for Baxter and one for himself. Why, if even half of what you say is true, there is great bounty, and an even greater danger hidden in the jungle's depths. Baxter swallowed his brandy, his face awash with astonishment. We mustn't let it go to waste. No. We have a responsibility to keep such horror under our thumb. We must organize another expedition, and return with proof for the Crown. Baxter was beginning to feel lightheaded. I was afraid you say that, Baxter. You speak like the rest. Though I know your heart is pure, we have no responsibility for anything. The responsibility is being taken care of, splendidly. We are no heroes. We are invaders and exploiters. If I were to return to that place, it would be on bended knee. But I will not return. I will not allow anyone else to either. Baxter's limbs were going numb, his vision vibrating. I believe, dear friend. You will feel quite different after you have glimpsed the gifts of the worm. Hargrove certainly did, though I'm afraid his mind couldn't take the stress. He resides in the madhouse now, where all orchid dealers belong, delirious as they are with greed. Reality began to tear itself apart in front of Baxter's eyes. I'll wait with you until morning, Baxter. You shall awake, a saner man. It ended in 2047. It was the flu, or some evolution of it anyway, and when it took the world, it took it fast. Everyone forgot all about COVID. It was a distant memory, a cold in comparison to the new disease. It was in every country in a matter of days and it killed by the millions. Everett was one of the survivors. Whether or not he was one of the lucky ones was still to be decided. He sat in a rocking chair on the front porch of a white house somewhere in the south. Cities and states didn't really matter anymore. This house was far nicer than the one he started with, and it was old, classic. 
It felt cozy. He liked it. He took the house when he was forced to run from his own wife. The thought disgusted him, but this was the world the disease had left him. Not that the disease had left. It lingered like a fart in a locked car with the windows up. It got everyone eventually. Everett had seen enough of it to know. They covered rooms and walls in bleach. They wore masks. They burned the dead and everything they touched, and they still got sick. It would just come out of nowhere one day. It started with a cough. Then came the fever and the vomiting, the diarrhea, the body aches and chills. Then the end. Days like today, Everett sat rocking on the porch in the sun rays that pierced the shadows, wondering why he was still alive. There was no way to not feel survivor's guilt. He was no better than anyone, certainly not his brother's daughter who was only 12 when the disease ravaged her. At least it was merciful enough to take her parents a couple of days later and not leave them to live with the pain of her loss. That whole family was better and worth more to the world than Everett. His brother was a doctor, an oncologist that worked with children. His wife was a social worker and their daughter was a great kid, straight A's and dreams of being president one day. Maybe she could have if the world had survived long enough. What was Everett? He was the manager of a grocery store. He walked out when things got bad. Grocery stores were breeding grounds for germs and Everett was afraid of death. He convinced Amy to quit the laundromat too. They didn't have any children or pets. There was nothing to tie them down, keep them from waiting for death like everybody else. So they ran. Everett would never stop seeing the end. It played behind his eyes every day. He could see it now. Everywhere he and Amy went, everyone was sweating, shaking, puking, bleeding, crying. They were crashing their cars, collapsing in the street, tugging on the pant legs of people walking by, people just starting to cough. People were falling or jumping from buildings. The sirens were a constant, except the emergency workers were just as sick as everyone else, and Everett knew even then it wouldn't be long before the sirens stopped forever. No one was going to save them. It was just a matter of time. Everett quit smoking. He wanted to be as healthy as possible. He still sipped his whiskey from time to time, though. With this in mind, he stood from the rocking chair, though it continued to rock behind him. He stared out at the empty street without so much as a bird lurking about. If he didn't know better, he would have thought he was the last person on earth. He would have thought he was completely alone. He wasn't alone, and he wasn't safe. His eyes roamed over each tree, bush, building, window, house, telephone pole, abandoned car. He checked every shadow, every hiding place. It wasn't the sick he was looking for or the disease that he feared anymore. It was the cure, the cure that swayed his wife, that led Amy away from him and made her the enemy. It was by luck and the grace of God that Everett and Amy managed to survive the downfall to avoid the sickness. They didn't do anything that thousands of other people weren't already doing. Everett wasn't foolish enough to think that they were immune. Well, Amy was now, but that was different. He knew the virus would claim him eventually, and he had to come to terms with it. He wrote a list of things he wanted to do, and he traveled alone to check things off of the list, to live as much as he could before the sickness came for him. There was more to live for, to fight for, when Amy was still with him, but she made her choice and now he made his. He was alone in a world where no one outlived the virus and he was going to enjoy it the best he could until his death, a death he was prepared for. Death was a surefire thing in the new world when the cure was just as deadly as the sickness. Everett snarled in bitterness and entered the house, closing and locking the door behind him. He walked to the kitchen to fetch his whiskey and sneezed on the way, a reminder that even during the apocalypse you need to dust. When he got to the kitchen counter and seized the bottle with his right hand, he froze. He could hear the padding of pawed feet traipsing through the hall behind him. I knew you'd come eventually he said without turning around. Instead, he reached up and opened the cabinet above the sink, retrieving a tumbler. He took it down and twisted the cap off the whiskey. A voice spoke from behind him. How could I not come, Everett? You're my husband. I was once, he said, pouring the whiskey into the glass. I don't remember getting divorced. Everett sighed. He picked up his glass and turned around, taking a sip. Amy stood in the doorway, naked, 
and as fit as she was on their honeymoon almost 20 years ago, but Everett felt no lust at the sight of her. There are no courts anymore, Amy, no lawyers, or I'd be happy to serve you papers. His wife, or what used to be his wife, frowned her disappointment. It doesn't have to be this way, Everett. I still love you. We were lucky enough to make it through the end. We can keep going. We can still have forever. Everett sipped from the amber liquid in his glass. No, we can't. For starters, you're a damned monster. Second, you don't have forever any more than I do. You're fooling yourself. The sickness can't get you, but it will get everyone else, me included. And then you and all your new friends will die of starvation. Amy frowned again. She took a step forward, prepared to round the kitchen island and close the distance. Everett held his glass out towards her. Liquid splashed over the side. Don't. Amy sighed. Her naked shoulders slumped. She shook her head. Don't you get it, Everett? If you don't come with me, if you don't join us, the others will come for you. You're right, okay? Food is dwindling. I can't keep them away from you forever. If they get hungry enough... Everett scoffed. He downed the rest of his glass and turned his back to Amy to refill it. I'm not like you, Amy. I still can't believe that you are like you. It sickens my stomach. I will not choose murder over death. You're a monster. Your new family are all monsters, and I do not consider joining them a better option. Now kindly get the hell out of my house. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see her reach out to him and then redraw her hand. His heart was pounding. He was so angry with her, so betrayed by her, but he could also feel the sadness that emanated from her. It was real, genuine. She was being truthful when she said, I want you to live. There was a moment where they stood there in silence. She was probably waiting for him to respond, but he had nothing to say. Eventually, she gave up and turned away. She dropped to all fours and scurried into the hallway. He cringed with disgust at the sound of her bone-breaking transformation. Everett didn't look into the hall. He focused on his drink and gave her time to leave however the hell she had come in. Then he placed the empty tumbler on the counter and cursed. In the new world, a man couldn't even get sick and die in peace. Everett knew that if Amy found him, the rest of her pack weren't far behind. He hadn't seen many people in his travels lately, which meant... Either they hadn't seen many people either and were hungry, or there were no people because they had already been consumed. Either way, Everett needed to move and he was pissed because he liked this house. A lot. He hurried around stuffing essentials in his backpack. As he did, he thought about the day they had found out about the cure. Wolves didn't get sick. There was something in the lupin DNA that made them immune. This extended to people who were also wolves. He and Amy had been scavenging a gas station convenience store for supplies when something leaped from the shadows. Amy had screamed from two aisles over. Everett looked up just in time to see the thing hurl itself through the air. He had a 45 caliber that had helped them get this far and he drew it from his jacket. He heard the crash and winced. When he came around the corner, the wolf had Amy pinned beneath it, drool spilling from its huge jaws to coat her face. She was crying and trying to turn away. Everett stepped carefully, doing his best to not make a sound. He stepped on an empty foil bag of chips and it crunched loudly under his foot. The beast turned away from Amy to look at him, but Everett was already close enough. He put the gun to the creature's head, thinking they were going to have meals for days by the size of it. Then something happened. The wolf started contorting and shifting. Its bones were snapping and popping, its flesh stretching and changing, its hair receding. Everett was so horrified and in awe of what was happening that he failed to pull the trigger and in little more than a moment, there was a young man, maybe in his mid-twenties, staring into the gun with fearful eyes. Please, don't, the stranger choked. Everett couldn't find his voice to respond. His wife had been attacked by a hungry wolf and now she was being straddled by a naked young man who looked upon Everett with terror filling his azure eyes. Everett's own gaze moved from the strange naked man to Amy. She was frozen by shock, staring wide-eyed at the young man that still had her pinned, her mouth agape. She was trembling. Everett hadn't seen her that frightened since the end had happened, and it bothered him. He cocked the gun, and the young man gasped. Please, I'm sorry, he offered, slowly raising a hand palm out. I can help you both. Make it so you don't be sick. Up, 
Everett told him, waving him with the gun. The naked man swallowed and slowly stood, one hand raised defensively and the other cupping his genitals. Amy slid out from under him and scrambled across the floor like a beaten puppy. Shaking fingers fumbled in her coat until she found her bowie knife. She pulled it out and held it before her, hands still trembling. Who are you? Everett asked. What are you? My name is James. I'm a lycanthrope. I'm immune. We all are. You can be too. You were going to eat my wife, Everett said, jabbing the gun at him. The young man swallowed again and nodded nervously. I was. You're right. I'm sorry. My pack sent me out to hunt. Food is not as plentiful as it used to be. Because of the sickness, Amy said, getting to her feet and shaking less now. But it doesn't affect you. The boy glanced her way for a moment, long enough to shake his head. Then his fearful gaze returned to the gun. Listen, I can turn you, make you like us. Then you can survive this thing. No more sickness. Everett grimaced. You eat people. The boy swallowed once more and nodded. We eat everything. It's survival, but when people are gone, we will still be here, and we will eat something else. What? I don't know. He shook his head. Well, James, I think the world is dangerous enough without having to compete with monsters. Everett put the barrel against the naked man's forehead. James was shivering, probably in part from being naked on a cool fall day and partly because he was scared. Everett didn't care. He didn't see how he could possibly let the guy go. The moment they turned their backs on him, he could turn back to his wolf form and tear them to pieces. Everett felt like he had no choice. He had to kill him. Then something grabbed his arm. He kept his head forward, but his eyes rolled to the side. Amy was there, shaking her head. He could kill us, Everett said without turning to face her. Even if he doesn't, the disease certainly will eventually. The sickness gets everyone, Everett. Finally, Everett glanced his wife's direction. What are you saying? Just that we should hear him out. Put the gun down. Everett growled like he was the wolf. He didn't want to let his guard down after seeing how fast the man had made the change from one form to the other. He backed up one step, then another and another, but kept the gun pointed at James. I'll hear him out, but I'm not putting the gun down. James nodded. Okay, I get it. Okay, just listen. My pack is small. We can afford to add a couple. It'll be all right. All I have to do is bite you once in my wolf form. I won't do real damage, I promise. I just have to get my saliva into your bloodstream. Then it takes 24 hours, but even during that time period, you will be immune to the sickness. As soon as you have me in you, it will no longer be a threat to you. Everett scoffed. But I will turn into a giant beast and eat people. That's supposed to be better somehow? Isn't it? Amy asked. He can turn at will. They can still be people. They can still love and live, Everett. It's the cure. We can beat this thing. Everett glared at her angrily. I can't believe you're even entertaining this idea. What about the people you would eat to survive? He was going to eat you. You think the others aren't like you? They don't have families? Hell, they're probably better than us and more deserving of survival if you want to get real about it. Amy stepped between Everett and James, so the gun was now pointed at her. Honey, you know those people are already dead, or as good as dead at least. They're not taking anyone who isn't already going to die. That's the world we live in now. They're already dead, Everett. They're already dead. No, they're not. Will they be eventually? Yes, but everyone dies eventually. Personally, I'd rather die from natural causes than being mauled by a wolf, ripped to pieces and eaten. He spit the words out like they tasted disgusting in his mouth. He glared at her over the gun he still hadn't lowered. What if the roles had been reversed? What if he was about to eat me? Would that be okay with you? It's just the food chain, Amy? Amy frowned. Her big eyes were sad. No, of course not. Of course I want you to live, Everett. I want us both to live. Behind her, James hadn't said a word in some time. He was just nervously watching, listening. Everett couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't changed and attacked them or at least tried to make his escape. That's what he would have done in the young man's shoes. You say natural causes, Amy said to him. 
but there is nothing natural about what this sickness does to the human body. How many times have we seen it now? The vomit, the blood, the agony. It's not like going to sleep and not waking up, Everett. It's not a more peaceful way to go than being booed for a predator. Everett shook his head. He couldn't believe he was hearing this. That's your justification for murdering people? You were going to kill him to keep me safe, weren't you? Weren't you? Everett's lip curled, but he didn't answer the question. How is it different? Murder for survival has always been the way, hasn't it? You're no better than him. Neither am I. Why not live? Because I'm not a goddamned monster, Everett barked. He stepped to the side and pointed the gun over her shoulder at James, who was still just standing there watching and listening, waiting for them to reach an outcome, a decision on all of their futures. You want to go with him to become a monster? That's your decision. You're a grown woman, but I won't be coming with you, and there will never be an us again after that. Amy frowned. You're right, because there won't be a you. The sickness will take you, and I will keep on going, Everett. Can you make the choice to die rather than live with your wife? If you willingly make the choice to become a murderous monster, you are not my wife, he said. He backed up further, the gun pointed out before him. The man who moments ago was going to eat Amy for supper put a supportive hand on her shoulder. Everett shook his head. That was it. When James started to change again, Everett turned and ran. He didn't trust himself to be able to outrun a giant wolf, so he knew he needed a head start. He didn't truly believe the gun would be enough if it wasn't point blank like it had been. His heart broke and he felt awful for leaving his wife in the hands of a monster, but she had made her choice. As he ran, he heard her scream in pain and for a moment he stopped, considered going back, trying to save her, but then he let out a howl of his own and raced onward. That was months ago. The sickness still had yet to reach him, but Amy had gotten to him twice now, and each time she did, the rest of the pack wasn't far behind. She was still trying to convince him to make the turn. The others were just hungry. Everett wasn't keen on either option. He wished they would just leave him alone, go a different direction. Maybe they would have if Amy had, but she couldn't bring herself to let him go, to let him die, and she continued to track him, to follow him, city to city and state to state. He didn't believe she would ever truly stop until the sickness forced her to, or her newfound family got to him. Sometimes Everett would actually pray to get sick, to go out like everyone else, like he felt like he was supposed to, rather than be eaten by his wife's lupin friends. He would ask God to just bring him home, but the days passed and he didn't get so much as a cough or a runny nose. Now he had to pack up and move again, and hope she would finally let him go and take the monsters elsewhere. But deep down, he knew she wouldn't. He pulled out the 45 and checked it. Satisfied, he returned it to his jacket and threw his backpack over his shoulders. Then he added a rifle as well. If it came down to it, he would shoot the wolves to save himself and whoever else was out there ready to become their next meal. They all looked the same in their wolf form, enormous and shaggy gray and white. There would be no way for him to know which one was Amy, and yet he knew that he would take the shot if he had to. He hated himself for it, but it didn't change the truth. As soon as Everett stepped back out onto the porch, he heard the howls cutting through the night. The wind picked up and the empty rocking chair beside him started its back and forth movement. He bit his lip and did his best to choke down his fear. He had to get away from this area and fast. He trotted down the steps to the walkway and hurried to the street. The rocking chair continued to sway and creak behind him. A look at the sky told him the moon was full. How fitting. He wished he could just drive out of here, but cars were useless. The roads were full of abandoned vehicles and wrecks, bones and toppled telephone poles, light poles, and mailboxes. He wouldn't make it a single block in a car before the wolves were on him, and he knew it. He had a motorbike in the last city he took residence in, but the gas station was out of gas and it was too much of a liability to lug around when it couldn't go anywhere. Now he had the next best thing, or at least that's what he told himself. Everett looked both ways for threats and then reached under the open door of a truck on its side. There he retrieved the bicycle he hid. He turned it upright, hopped on, and pedaled like his life depended on it. The bike wasn't as fast as he would like, but it could weave around the obstructions in the road. A dog barked somewhere off in the distance and his heart jumped. Why couldn't she just let him go? He let her make her own choice. She could just extend him the same level of courtesy. 
The muscles in his legs burned, but he knew that he couldn't dare slow down. Not yet. The wolves were out there, and they were hungry. Maybe Amy was in deep enough with him now that she could say, no, not him, but Everett didn't want to bank on that. He kept his eyes on the road despite the rustles of movement to his left and his right, the snarls, barks, and howls that surrounded him. He was afraid, but he knew he couldn't afford to miss something and topple the bike. That would mean his death for sure. So his heart raced and his legs raced and the wheels spun as Everett jerked the handles from side to side, slicing his way between wrecked cars and around what remained of the dead. He could hear the patter of paws nearby. He didn't want to look, but he couldn't help it. The paws banged on metal hard enough to dent it. Everett quickly glanced over and saw a wolf running parallel with him. It was bounding over the cars left in the road. Everett pedaled harder. His body ached and he wanted to scream. Then the road opened up and he was flying downhill. He chanced to look back and saw the wolf atop a car at the top of the hill just watching him as he careened away. Was it Amy just not wanting to let him go or one of the others? He wished there was a way to tell. Everett turned his head back just in time to see the shopping cart on its side before him. He tugged right, but there wasn't enough time. His front tire caught the metal rungs and he flipped over, hitting the pavement hard. He groaned in pain, but immediately slid the rifle from his shoulder. He held it out before him and turned every which way. He couldn't see or hear anything. He looked up at the top of the hill he had come down and the wolf was gone. Everett threw the rifle back over his shoulder and grabbed the bicycle, ignoring the pain in his bones and the torn skin on his knee and shin from the fall. He hopped on it and looked forward. Then he cussed. There was a wolf standing in the road before him. It was enormous. Everett kept his eyes on the creature and slowly slid the rifle back off his shoulder. As he did, the wolf stood on its haunches and started to contort and change. Everett wanted to look away from the shifting bones and stretching flesh, but he knew it was too dangerous to let his guard down. Instead, he stared down the rifle sight at what ended up being his wife's naked form. He cussed loudly again and snapped. Let me go! Don't you see you're leading them right to me? If they eat me, it will be because of you. You will die without me, Everett. Please stop running, she said, stepping forward. Everett pulled the bolt on the rifle and pointed it at her, forcing her to stop. I'm going to die because of you, he snarled. You want to save me? Lead them away. Take your friends in a different direction. Let me go. Amy frowned. She eyed the gun and chanced to step forward anyway. Everett jammed it at her. Don't make me, he said, and she stopped moving. Her frown deepened. If I let you go, you die for sure, Everett. It hasn't gotten you yet, but the sickness will come for you eventually. I have the cure. You don't even have to be with me if you don't want to. I just want you to live. The quiet night was disrupted by a bellowing howl in the distance. Everett twitched, his hands tensed on the rifle. You don't just want me to live. You want me to live by your rules, to live as a monster. I won't. Now get out of the way and stop following me. Please don't do this, Everett. Move. It's not too late. Move. Amy sighed and stepped to the side. Everett threw the rifle over his shoulder and pedaled the bike by her. As he did, he could hear her bones snapping, and he grit his teeth and pedaled harder. He pushed his body to its limits and rode throughout the night. He didn't see Amy again, but he didn't believe that she was gone either. She wasn't going to give up. It was infuriating. When he couldn't take any more and he had to stop, he hopped off the bike and walked it to the side of a tall yellow house surrounded by thick oaks. He hid the bicycle in the shadow beside a bush, not that there was anyone left to steal it from him, but he didn't believe there was such a thing as too safe. Not anymore. He didn't go in the house. If the wolves came and found the bicycle, that would be the first place they would look. He couldn't hide out in the open. If he did, they would catch his scent and drag him out while he slept. He would become a meal before he even understood what was happening. Everett walked three houses up and turned at the corner, going down the side street a couple of houses. Then he looked over his shoulder. He paused, held his breath, and listened. No pause, no howls. Satisfied, he went around to the back of the house. The back door was locked, but there was a window that was open a crack. 
he forced it open enough to slip in head first. When he collided with the tiled kitchen floor, he immediately stood and closed the window, locking it. Then he took the house room by room looking for threats, assessing the situation. He wished he could turn the lights on, but that would be a beacon to the wolves, so he continued on one room at a time until he was sure that no one or no thing was hiding in wait for him. The house was full of long past rotten food and some animal was stashing its kills in the corner of the pantry. It smelled terrible, but Everett didn't clean it. He hoped the odor would mask his own scent and throw off the wolves if they came looking. He just wanted to stay the night, to rest, and then get on the move again at first light. He went upstairs where the rot wasn't as strong and found a skeleton in one of the beds. There wasn't much left of whoever they had been, but he was sure the sickness that had taken them was probably lingering, so he went to the bathroom and laid in the tub. He closed the curtain just in case, and before long he was asleep. Everett dreamed of a time when things were much different. He saw himself in a fine tailored suit, burgundy, dancing with Amy who looked exquisite in a ball gown. They were smiling at each other, thinking this was going to be their world forever, totally unaware of what was coming. It was his brother's wedding, his brother who was long gone now, resting in peace with his bride and their daughter. At least he hoped they were at peace. The living world certainly wasn't. When he awoke, the sun was bright enough to blind him even through the shower curtain that extended past the side of the tub. Everett groaned. He stood, but it took him a moment. His back screamed at him. His legs were still sore from all the pedaling, and his neck was stiff from sleeping in the hard bathtub. He stretched and rubbed at his face. Everett tried the sink and sighed with relief when water came out of the faucet. He used his hands as a cup and splashed it over his face. Then he drank several handfuls. He opened his backpack and got out his toothbrush and toothpaste. A dental infection could be a death sentence now, so he did his best to take care of them. When he was done, he sat at the top of the stairs and looked at his list. He didn't know how much longer he could avoid the wolves and their gigantic canines, so he figured he should try to cross something off of it if he could. The end could come for him any day, any moment. He perused the paper and crossed something off he had done the other day. Then he searched for something he could do now, something reasonable. He wasn't even sure what town or city he was in. He couldn't very well plan to see a tourist attraction. Everett smiled when he saw Ice Cream Shop. He wanted to go behind the counter like he worked there and make himself some ice cream. He could probably do that, if the freezer still had power and the ice cream wasn't liquid. What was the worst that could happen? It would make him sick? He laughed to himself. Then he nodded, folded the paper, and put it away. He was going to ride a few towns over to put some more distance between him and the pack, and then he was going to find an ice cream shop. He enjoyed having a plan. It helped him to survive the chaos of the current world if he had an agenda. He wished he could develop a routine, some level of normalcy, but there was no way he could, not with Amy out there looking for him. He got his backpack and his guns and headed out, wanting to move quickly. Everett doubled back to where he stashed his bike, and it wasn't there. He sighed and cussed under his breath. Had another human found it, or was it one of the wolves? He hoped someone used it to get away, to survive, and it wasn't just trash to keep him around for dinner. Everett kicked the nearby tree and headed off on foot. He jogged as long as he could and walked when he ran out of breath or his muscles burned and begged for a break. He only stopped to check some of the abandoned cars for supplies. He found a working flashlight, which was cool, because his old one had been out of batteries for some time now. There was an unopened bag of chips too, stale as all get out, but edible. If only they had come with a drink. Everett traveled all day. He hated stopping, knowing that the wolves were on his tail. He wanted to go as far as his body would let him. Just the same, being out at night, especially on foot, sent his nerves haywire. There were too many shadows, too many obstacles. He felt like prey, and he hated it. Once the darkness fell over the road like a blanket, he decided he had to find shelter again. Maybe tomorrow, he would find that ice cream shop. Everett climbed on top of a work van and surveyed the area. It was pretty open, and that drew a frown from him. At the top of the hill was a gas station. It was well lit, so that was a good sign. The area still had power, or maybe the gas station had a backup generator that hadn't burned out yet. He wouldn't know until he got there. Maybe he could see more from there and find a safe place to hide out until sunrise. He hadn't seen or heard any sign of the wolves all day. 
He didn't know if that was a good or bad thing. Time would tell, he was sure. Everett stayed low and hurried up the hill between the broken cars. He couldn't help but stop when he saw the horse carcass. It hadn't fallen to the sickness. It hadn't died when the world did. It was still warm, opened up like a Ziploc bag, its contents removed completely. Its eyes were frozen wild with fear. Suddenly, the quiet of the night really bothered him. He hadn't heard the wolves because they were hunting. Hopefully, the horse filled their bellies for the time being. Everett needed to hide somewhere, and fast. He stood from the horse, and his eyes danced over all the details of the nighttime street. He saw nothing but the broken relics of a dead world. He knew there was more out there, though. The wolves couldn't be far, or the horse wouldn't have still been warm. Everett grimaced and then hurried up towards the gas station. He reached the front door and paused to look over his shoulder. He could swear he could hear the soft footfalls of graceful paws, but if he did, his eyes couldn't show him where. With a deep breath, he yanked the door open and went in. A bell jingled when he entered and he cringed, drawing in on himself. Instinctively, his hand went to the rifle on his shoulder. He slipped it off and held it, prepared to use it if he had to. He took a few steps in and that's when he saw the bicycle. His bicycle. It was at the back of the middle aisle, upside down, rear wheels spinning. Everett tensed. He held tightly to the rifle and approached, slowly. He was holding his breath. When he got to the bicycle, he saw a man lying next to it. He looked a lot like the horse, cracked open like a lobster dinner. There was a snarling wolf the size of a man hungrily gnawing at the inside of him and another tearing into the meat of his thigh, shaking its head side to side in order to rip the meat from the bone. Everett aimed the rifle and silently prayed they wouldn't notice him. Then an enormous paw struck the rifle's barrel, knocking it sideways out of his hands. He watched in horror as it flew across the back aisle, hit the floor, and slid across the tiles. Everett gasped. He looked over at the wolf that had disarmed him. It was standing on its hind legs like a human and staring over its bloody muzzle at him, looking directly into his eyes. Amy? he questioned. The lips pulled back in a snarl to show the yellowed razor-sharp teeth in full. Everett dove forward and hit the ground with a shoulder roll. He glanced back and saw the wolf still standing there, staring his way and growling at him. His eyes found the others, eating the man who had stolen his bicycle. They glanced up from their meal to make eye contact with him, but then returned to their food, chewing and slurping loudly, snorting as they breathed from their noses so they could keep eating. Everett scrambled to his feet. He ran for the counter. The wolf that had knocked away his rifle stepped over the dead man's legs and walked after him. It didn't drop back to all fours. It continued on like it thought it was human. It wasn't. Not anymore. Everett reached in his jacket and found the 45. He pulled it free as he rounded the counter. Behind the counter was another body, this one wearing a gas station uniform. Everett wondered if the woman had stolen the clothes to have a clean outfit or if she had actually continued showing up to work long after the end of the world. Maybe she just didn't know what else to do. He would understand if that was the case. Everett supposed it didn't matter now. She was nothing but an empty shell, her ripped throat dragged across the floor. Everett noticed the keys in her hand and his eyes roamed until they located the office door. It wasn't far. He glanced back at the wolf that had been following him and it was gone. Where the hell did it go? The 45 in one hand he grabbed at the key with his other. The woman's dead hand held them firmly. Everett gritted his teeth and tugged harder, but he couldn't get them free. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the other wolves had finished with their meal and they were stalking his way, low to the ground and creeping silently. Everett cussed. He went from holding his breath to breathing rapidly in a panic. He tugged at the keys to no avail. Then he shoved the 45 in the direction of the skulking wolves and pulled the trigger twice. The boom jerked his arm and sent pain lancing through his shoulder, but it was enough to make the wolves jump away and dart across the store to find safety. It was the last thing he wanted to do, but Everett knew he needed to use two hands to pry the keys from the rigor mortis of the dead girl. He shoved the 45 back into his jacket and, ignoring the pain in his shoulder, gripped the key ring with both hands. He pulled with all his might and heard snarling behind him. His heart raced and his breath quickened, but he didn't look back. He couldn't. Everett pulled at the keys. Behind him, he could hear the clack of long loop and nails slapping tiles. Then the keys came free and he bolted forward. Only when he reached the door did he look back. The wolf had its front low and its back high, like it was prepared to leap. 
It was snarling ferociously, spittle hanging like threads from its black gums. Everett twisted the first key in the knob and it turned. Luck was on his side again. He looked over and saw the wolf leap. Then he shoved his body into the door and it opened inward. He fell through just as he saw the giant wolf land where he had just been standing. Everett slammed the door shut and the wolf banged against the other side. Everett reached up and twisted the lock. Then he scrambled backwards on all fours until his back hit an obstacle and stopped him. He pulled the 45 back out of his pocket and pointed it at the door. Then things went quiet. Everett remained there listening and waiting. He was breathing hard. His fingers moved over the gun and adjusted and readjusted, itching to pull the trigger. Still, the silence remained. He couldn't stand it anymore and he got to his feet. Slowly, Everett approached the door. He looked through the small window in its center and saw the remains of the bodies being dragged away by the muzzles of the wolves. A moment later, he heard the bell of the front door. Everett supposed it was time to feed the rest of the pack. He thought of Amy feeding on these people's organs, tearing at their flesh and his stomach twisted in knots. He wanted to vomit. Instead, he turned from the door and worked to find the light switch. Everett took in the room for the first time and saw that the dead woman had been living here. There was a sleeping bag and a pillow, food remnants, and piles of uniforms. Everett sighed. He didn't like being locked in there with the wolves knowing it, but he didn't see any better options. It was late and dark, and leaving would be a death sentence for sure. On the other hand, he had no idea if the dead woman had been sick, and the idea of being in a tiny room with all her personal belongings didn't sit well with him either. Of course, he reminded himself that if it came between the wolves and the sickness, he had already made his choice. Sighing, Everett made himself comfortable on the sleeping bag. He kept his eyes on the door and his hand on the gun. He sat and watched and listened for what felt like forever, but he knew there was no way he could sleep. Not this night. When his stomach yelled at him, he dug through his backpack and frowned at how little he had left. He dug through the dead woman's food stores and found an unopened can of processed spaghetti rings. He yanked off the pull tab top and dug into it with his fingers, shoveling it into his mouth. He closed his eyes and moaned with delight, laughing in between bites at how good something so bad could be in the right moment. It's the little things, he thought. Satisfied and feeling like the wolves might be satisfied with their own meal enough to leave him alone for the night, Everett laid down. He still kept his eyes on the door and his hand on the 45. Then he was dreaming about his ice cream shop. Except in his dream, the world was alive, and he was smiling and mixing ice cream on a marble countertop for happily cheering children. There was lights and music. It was a different world. A happy world. When Everett awoke, he was still smiling. He wondered if the world would ever be like that again. Would it fix itself and start over anew, or was it really just over forever? He knew he wouldn't live long enough to find out the answer, and his smile fell away. That's when he noticed that the door was open. Everett felt a surge of panic. He gasped and scrambled into a sitting position. When he moved, he felt a twinge of sharp pain in his shoulder. He reached over and touched it and he could feel the wound. What had happened? He drew his hand back and looked at the blood on his fingers. His eyes nervously scanned the darkness. Who's there? Where are you? He shouted into the void. Everett could hear the sounds of snapping bones behind him. He gasped and lunged forward, spinning around. When he righted himself, Amy was there, looking at him with sadness in her gaze. Even in her human form, blood still lined her lips and chin. What did you do? Everett asked quietly, then again with more power to his voice. What did you do? I'm sorry, she said, and she sounded like she meant it. She frowned. I had no choice. They weren't going to wait any longer. Everett, they are coming for you, so I had to come first. There was no other way. Please forgive me. I'm sorry, but I couldn't let you die. I just couldn't. Everett slowly shook his head. It wasn't your choice to make, he said. You made your choice, and I made mine. Why couldn't you just respect that? Because I love you. What was I supposed to do? Why are you so damned stubborn? I had a chance to save you. I had to take it. Everett was breathing hard, trembling. He could already feel the effect of her bite. Time was running out. He would be a monster soon. He swallowed hard and raised the 45. 
Now I have to save myself, he said, putting the gun to the side of his head and pressing it to his temple. No, Everett, don't, Amy commanded. Then he squeezed his eyes shut and pulled the trigger. There was a dull click, no blast. He was still there, still alive. His arm fell to the floor at his side, still holding the empty gun. Everett coughed and he couldn't help but laugh. He finally got it, and it wouldn't matter in a moment once he was fully looping. He looked down at the gun and tears filled his eyes. I'm so sorry, Amy said to him. I know you. I knew you would. I took them first. I had to. Everett looked up and met her eyes then. He glared through the wetness and growled, You didn't have to, he said angrily. Then he felt his bones start to break, and he screamed. I found your list, she said to him soothingly. You can do all those things now. We can do them together. Everett screamed again. Then his scream changed into a howl. Part 1. The Letter The cruelest gift in the world, I think, is the distinctly human ability to partly comprehend one's own consciousness. We are all aware of our own individual sentience, but without the slightest idea as to why. I believe that this awareness was an evolutionary mistake, a natural but inherently unnatural phenomenon. In the pursuit of understanding the only thing that will become clear is the absolute absurdity of this existence. Is there even any reason to pursue rational understanding in an obviously irrational universe? In any case, I've deduced that this must be why suicide and religion become such popular answers amongst lost souls. Is it possible to simply live a life of ignorance in which these questions don't keep you awake until the sun rises? Or do we all live plagued by questions to which no man can ever know the answers? Perhaps death will grant answers, or perhaps death will grant you the void in which you will cease to be. The void is a concept that can't be comprehended. One can't even begin to understand what real, genuine nothingness would be like. It's impossible. The strongest fear is the fear of the unknown, as is only logical, so suicide isn't an answer I was willing to accept, to take the plunge into darkness without any idea of what lay on the other side was nonsensical. I had to know what lay beyond. Ironically, this obsession gave my previously meaningless life some resemblance of meaning, a self-assigned goal that presented the necessary motivation to continue, and so I clung to it. The argument of what constituted a truly valuable life was often a topic of debate between a colleague of mine, Thomas Dalton, and I. We were both professors, he of mathematics, myself of ancient history at the University of Dartmouth, England. I think I would have even considered him a friend at times. He believed, as fanciful as it sounds, that love was the key to a happy life. But to agree would be to admit that value and happiness were one and the same, which I simply do not believe to be true. A man can lead a truly valuable life, full of success. He can leave a legacy that permanently marks his name in the history books, yet he can never know happiness. A man who pursues both love and happiness can live a normal life with a loving family, but may never know his true potential. He may lay on his deathbed, filled with anxiety and regret, wishing for a little longer. However, as much as Thomas and I disagreed, we agreed ultimately that in the end, the man who achieves both love and value would be a truly great man who lived his life to its fullest. However, this man would, no doubt, have the weight of the world on his shoulders, as all great men do, and I wonder if this man would have nights where he himself wished for a simpler life. A man who truly lived, yet wishing he hadn't. That's ultimately the burden of being human. No matter the path you take, the answers you find are never concrete. The knowledge of a discovery was brought to my attention in the early months of 1919. 
I arrived at work early one morning to find a letter on my desk. Upon reading it, I was overwhelmed with an unmistakable sense of dread. It was from a man in Egypt. He described a tomb unlike the others that had been previously discovered. Peculiar hieroglyphs had, by all accounts, been painstakingly etched into the stone above an opening in one of their archaeological dig sites. The symbols were utterly unique. The writer seemed to have attempted a crude sketch of one of the symbols, but either this was the discovery of an entirely new hieroglyph, or the man contacting me had gone completely mad. The symbol did resonate with me for reasons unclear to myself at the time. The letter asked for my assistance. After spending so much of my time behind a desk, I was no doubt intrigued, even a little excited, to get back into the field. My curiosity had gotten the better of my rising fear and uncertainty. The letter wasn't signed, however. It had left enough details for me to investigate further. I like to believe that I was a man of fact and science. However, I cannot deny that I am often optimistic. I like to believe that there is an order to this chaos. This letter, falling into my lap with the information it contained, was too intriguing to have been completely random. Too big to be a consequence of the irrational universe and all its absurdity. This letter, I thought, must mean something. Perhaps it was an invitation for me to uncover the value I so craved in my life. I was a fool to have let myself believe something so hopeful. I brought the letter to Thomas's attention. He seemed less enthusiastic than I had hoped. However, I could tell he was curious. I knew that Thomas was miserable at work. Our conversations were the highlight of his days. And, if I'm being honest, they were the highlight of mine as well. Thomas's unhappiness would be the key to encouraging him. A week or two in Egypt, a small change to the daily routine, I knew he'd want it. I just had to wait for him to come around to the idea. It took less than a week for Thomas to admit he wanted to come to Egypt. I was completely prepared to go alone, however, I simply felt more confident with Thomas at my side. In the days while Thomas was deciding, I will admit I grew further apprehensive about the idea, but I was sure that this was something big. The letter mentioned that the find was deep in the western desert. A map had been scratched into the back of the letter with a pen that was clearly running out of ink. This map was so crudely drawn that it really wasn't much help. Thomas was confident that we could ask Guy to read the map once in Egypt. I wasn't overly enthusiastic about going without further preparation, but I was battling an inner conflict of curiosity and uncertainty. A battle which my curiosity had long since won. If I'm being honest, I knew I was going to Egypt the moment I read the letter. It's as if I was being pulled towards it, and only in fleeting moments of clarity would I realize that what I was doing was condemning. In these moments, I would be filled with fear, but they were just that, fleeting moments. Thomas and I boarded the HMS Hannibal less than a month later, a Royal Navy vessel that was temporarily docked in Devonport for repairs bound for Alexandria. Thomas offered the captain a ludicrous amount of money in order for us to be granted passage to Egypt, with the added bonus of keeping our mission off the record. Much of our journey was spent in silence. My time aboard the vessel was mostly spent in deep thought. I felt a fear building within me that I couldn't shake. As I watched the sea with each passing day, I became entranced by the darkness beneath the surface. Its depth seemed to have no end. At night, I had dreams of creatures beneath the waves. Dreams of creatures with soft gray skin, luminescent figures that spoke to me from the dark, yet I could never understand them. I know now that they weren't dreams, but confirmation that we were heading in the right direction. Part 2. Egypt Alexandria was distinctly otherworldly. Once within the busy streets, I couldn't help but feel like an invader. The air was thick and hard to breathe, and the heat of the midday sun bared down on us without mercy. Even outside, I felt claustrophobic, 
The air around us felt as if it had a physical weight that grew heavier and harder to bear the longer we remained outside. Egypt at this time had begun a currently ongoing revolution against British occupation. With rising political tension amongst the locals, I held my breath after every sentence I uttered, in anticipation of their reaction to my unquestioningly southern English accent. Thomas wasted no time in finding a guide willing to take us out into the desert. He made contact with a local who, upon examining the map on the letter, laid the letter under a more detailed map of the western desert and transferred the information he could, leading the way to our undoing. We were only in Alexandria very briefly. No one wanted to remain there for longer than was completely necessary. Even our guide seemed to be pleased to be leaving. Our guide was a very short man. He wore a long, loose-fitting robe that covered his sandals and a black headscarf, through which only his eyes were visible. The man's eyes were rather peculiar. The skin around them appeared gray. His eyes were unnaturally dark, yet appeared to emit a dim glow. I tried not to stare, as I didn't want to upset the man. Looking into them for too long also made my stomach turn. He barely uttered a single word during our time with him. It's still not clear to me whether he even knew a word of English, although of course it wasn't expected of him. It was clear he had no interest in making friends. I was beginning to worry that Thomas had become obsessed with this mission, however. I couldn't deny the progress we were making. Against better judgment, I was not about to go home now. The three of us set off immediately on camelback. Thomas nor I knew how to ride. However, the stranger rode ahead and led the way, pulling us along with rope, attaching us together in a line. A rope tied to the stranger's saddle led to a ring in the nose on my camel. Another rope from my saddle led back to Thomas. I felt a strange sense of discomfort at the thought of these creatures being pulled along by a metal ring that had been forced through their noses. They existed simply to be pulled around and serve their human masters. However, this may be the view of a man who didn't grow up around animals, a sheltered view. I doubt a camel is capable of putting much thought into its situation, nor do I imagine they care much, as long as they are fed. To live with a simple mind, to lack the awareness to comprehend one's own predicament, may at the end of it all be a real blessing. I do often envy the ignorant, but when you wholeheartedly believe a lie, you can live an uncompromised life in which you simply chase what feels good. Once you begin to seek the truth, seek answers, and begin questioning, you will find yourself lost. However, I also believe that the ignorant will come face to face with the path they chose once on their deathbed. The moment they realize that their life will come to an end, they will start to question it all perhaps wish for more time. It's funny, isn't it? How the human mind is simultaneously the most incredible gift and yet the greatest burden in the known universe. In comparison to all other known life, humans seem alien. Perhaps other intelligent life prospered on other worlds, perhaps even more intelligent than us. If they were to make contact with us all, I wonder how the average man would react. Perhaps extraterrestrial life would be seen as God. After all, if a life form more advanced made contact, if they had the power to wipe our world from the universe, would that not make them God? In the same way, humans are gods to all animals on this planet. Alien life to me only further disproves God. It would prove that life, if the conditions are right, can naturally appear in any environment. Life, even intelligent life like humans, is an entirely natural phenomenon. However, admitting that would be admitting just how irrelevant we are as individuals. Thomas and I often discussed religion. We passed our three-day camel journey by doing just that. The stranger never contributed. The stranger never contributed, but I could tell he was always listening intently. Whether he understood or not is still unclear. However, it doesn't really matter. Thomas and I came off and came back to the same conclusion, that religion is part of any early society, for the purpose of keeping order, 
and giving the average man a moral compass. There are many religions in the world, many older than Christianity. All human societies seem to have come up with a religion of their own. Years ago, there would be no better way to ensure that a man didn't just do as he liked, unless, of course, he thought in doing so, he'd be signing his name for eternal suffering. Heaven and hell are concepts most religions come up with. Even reincarnation relies on a karma system. In my mind, if the only thing keeping a man decent is the prospect of divine reward, is he at his core really a good man? Religion undoubtedly gives people's lives meaning. If you believe that your life or soul is special, that would certainly give even the simple merchant a sense of pride. I can't blame people for turning to religion, for believing in a god or gods. I also can't blame the people who came up with the concepts and stories. If I were to rule the nation, I'd introduce religion myself, despite not believing. It brings people together. Religion is the best way to ensure the start of a healthy nation. It also helps explain the otherwise inexplicable, keeps the everyday man out of his own head. As we learn more about the world, make more discoveries, continue to advance, more and more religions make less and less sense, which is why I simply cannot believe, despite the comfort it would bring. Perhaps the key to happiness is to forgo analyzing life, a focus on the day-to-day. -day. However, I don't intend to be happy. I never intended to be happy. I intend to make sense of it. Thomas was always more agnostic. He believed that a god may exist, but that the life form above us would be nothing like anyone can imagine. I think he only believed that as some sort of backup plan. I think he lied to himself so that in his final days his soul may still be saved for his little faith. Most religions seem to suggest that to completely disregard the ideas they put forward is to condemn yourself to whatever version of hell they've come up with. I never shared Thomas's fear of the afterlife, for I never believed in the concept of a soul, unlike my colleague. I am not ignorant to the fact that religion has been the spark of many wars, and will likely continue to be. With technology advancing, the more we connect, the more different cultures learn about each other, the more we have to disagree on. I find it quite amusing, however, equally disappointing that people continue to kill one another over fantasies or silly political disputes. I once wondered if technology might prove to be the end of our species. It would make sense to me that the more advancements we make, the more dangerous we become to ourselves, as made evident by the merciless death machines used at the Somme. How disappointing it would be if our species came to an end at the hand of religious opinions or the greed of our leaders. The sun during the day was unbearable, yet the night brought with it a biting cold that forced me to breathe through short, sharp breaths. I really did feel as if I shouldn't have been there, as if even my surroundings were begging me to go home. With each day we got closer, I felt panic building in my chest. Each evening we set up the campsite, lit a fire, ate dinner, then I'd scramble into my tent, anxiety slowly building within me until I fell into the security of sleep. During the first night, I found myself wishing I didn't wake up the next morning. A primal fear was building within me. However, the sun would rise, the stranger would wake, and we'd pack up and set off again. I started to firmly believe that we should turn around and leave, however. I felt a pull that I couldn't shake. Every time I tried to confide in Thomas about my fear, my tongue would lock up, and no words would escape me. During the final night, I lay in my tent and found myself pulling at my hair. I felt my chest tighten as anxiety overwhelmed me. I closed my eyes tight and felt tears roll down my cheeks. I suppose that was when it dawned on me. The night was to be my last as a human being. I don't remember falling asleep that night. When morning came, Thomas and I found ourselves lying atop a sand dune. Upon awakening, we looked down over a collection of sandstone ruins, the sun slowly rising behind us. 
the stranger, camels, nor the campsite were anywhere to be seen. I accepted in that moment. Our only option was to continue forward, no matter what that meant for my colleague and I. Thomas and I were both loners in our daily lives. No wives, children, or any real friends. I can't speak for my colleague, but this fact didn't bother me much. I had given up on genuine human connection a long time ago. I found life easier to manage when I was the only one I had to worry about. I do realize, however, that my lack of real human connection has made me rather indifferent to the world around me. I found that I lost touch with my emotions a long time ago. However, I am able to think logically rather than emotionally, which has presented itself as a benefit to me. I have come to realize that in order to validate my existence, I must achieve something that I otherwise wouldn't if I spent time with others, desperately trying to convince myself that I had a good life by chasing temporary feelings of joy. All these other people must soon realize that to live a normal life is to have never truly existed. Who will remember these people? Their children. Once their children become adults and have children of their own, all that their lives will have amounted to is becoming a part of a cycle. A cycle in which eventually the people involved will no longer matter. Perhaps being forgotten isn't such an awful idea to many, but in my mind, why should I have ever existed in the first place if it amounted to nothing? However, this idea stems from my false belief that my life is supposed to have meaning, which of course it doesn't. I suppose everyone thinks that their life is supposed to be meaningful as a result of seeing the world through their own eyes. We all live day to day, forever amongst our own thoughts. This must give each of us our own sense of self-importance. The inability to see anyone else as quite as important as ourselves must also be why the majority of people are partly narcissistic. Everyone has an element of cruelty within them after all. Golden sand stretched out to the horizon in every direction. Towering sand dunes surrounded us, almost resembling waves frozen in time. They shimmered in the sunlight. And if it wasn't for the rising temperature, I may have stayed a little longer to admire Earth's beauty. Sights like that have always helped me clear my mind. I've never been an optimistic man, however. I have always felt that despite the bleakness of life, no one can take the feeling of watching the sunrise from you. The feeling I had in that moment reminded me why I was still alive. Thomas and I made our way down to the ruins of what was clearly once a village or town of some sort. The site was walled in by the surrounding dunes. Once amongst the ruins, the sun was only barely visible. The shadows created by the dunes provided much needed relief from the heat. However, the atmosphere down there was utterly alien. I've never felt so unwelcome. It was as if the air in the place was poison. The majority of these ruins were collections of sandstone foundations and scattered rocks. The buildings themselves had clearly collapsed long ago. From what I could tell, the site was once perhaps a collection of houses for a small ancient community. A community of which my colleague and I weren't the first to discover. However, the place was empty, silent. I at least expected to meet an archaeologist team or see at least some sign of a team or their equipment, but the place was completely barren. Thomas spotted an opening in one of the sand dunes. Darkness flowed out of the opening like smoke, beckoning us towards it. I felt myself take steps towards it, however, I don't recall that being my intention. My body started moving of its own accord, and my mind was left trapped inside, watching as I moved toward the dark, unable to command my own movements. Above the opening were those unusual symbols from my letter that I had grown so familiar with. The symbols were etched into a sandstone archway that kept the sand above from swallowing the opening. As Thomas and I grew closer, the opening seemingly grew larger, the sandstone cracking as it grew, allowing small amounts of sand to slip between the cracks. 
The symbols seem to resemble drawings rather than any form of ancient written language. Seeing them in person, they almost look like depictions of monsters, the type only a diseased mind could conceive. As panic set in, I tried to scream. I wanted to shout for Thomas to pull me away, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't make a sound. My mind was racing as my body continued forward. My eyes were locked into the darkness and I couldn't look away. My body was no longer mine. I was trapped, only able to spectate as I marched in, the dark wrapping itself around me until eventually I couldn't see anything at all. Part 3. The Gift In the darkness, I found myself unable to see or feel anything. Even my sense of smell had abandoned me. I had unwillingly walked into complete sensory deprivation. I was utterly alone with only my thoughts, which was perhaps the most terrifying state to be in. Unless I counted the seconds, I had no sense of passing time. It felt as if I was floating. I felt weightless powerless, completely alone. Initially, I had thought that counting the seconds would help calm me down, keep my sanity intact. However, after 1,000 seconds, I gave up. In the dark, I began to contemplate my predicament. Perhaps I'd be stuck here forever. Is this what death feels like? If I was dead, surely I'd be unable to think. Surely my sense of being would disappear and I'd cease to be entirely. Unless I was wrong about the existence of a soul. Perhaps my body was crushed in the cave and my mind had now been set free into the void, forever to be left to myself. For a moment, I thought perhaps heaven and hell do exist and for my lack of faith, I was turned away from both, to be left in the dark for all eternity. I find it funny how even the most atheistic minds look for some divine assistance when in a state of complete hopelessness. I suppose we like to believe that someone, something, has to be responsible. To admit that life is entirely led by one's own decisions is to recognize that when all is hopeless, it is entirely left to oneself to find a way out of the dark. In the void, I eventually began to feel the warmth travel up throughout my body. I first noticed a tingling in my feet which slowly crept up inside me. The way it passed through me was not altogether unpleasant. I remember looking down at my hands after the feeling had passed my shoulders, only to be able to see them. My body had reappeared and was strangely unshadowed by the surrounding darkness. I touched my face, rubbed the stubble on my cheeks and almost began to cry. The fact that my sense of touch had begun to return felt like a small act of mercy. Without warning, I felt the ground beneath me give way. I felt my stomach drop as the unquestionable sensation of falling overcame me. I began tumbling through the air, unable to determine which way was up. Breathing became harder and harder until eventually I couldn't breathe at all. I continued spinning and tumbling faster and faster, my limbs flailing as I gasped for air. I could hear the low groan of a monster in the dark and closed my eyes tight. The groans sounded as if they were coming from inside my head, from inside my thoughts. Moments later, I must have fainted. Thankfully, darkness yet again swallowed me whole. When I woke, I appeared to be floating. I could see my body as if I was standing in broad daylight. However, my entire surroundings were still in darkness. I could not even see the floor beneath me. My senses had remained intact. When I bent down to touch the surface I found myself on, my hands fell beneath my feet. I swept my hand around, felt the bottom of my shoes just to be sure. I was indeed suspended in the air. I could not tell how high I was as pitch darkness still surrounded me. After a moment, I noticed a shape in the dark. The shape convulsed violently. Tendrils or tentacles, perhaps, grew out from it as it writhed. I could not make out its form, however, it seemed to emit its own light naturally. 
As what I can only assume were its limbs grew closer towards me, I could see a faint glow oozing through the grey, slimy skin. Groans came again. I could feel the unearthly noise vibrate through my head. Covering my ears only amplified the sound. This creature seemingly communicated telepathically in a language that was beyond human comprehension. I fell to my knees as pain shot through my mind with every noise it uttered, begging it to stop speaking. As I knelt, I felt the wet slime of its skin touch my face. I dared not open my eyes in fear of what may happen to my mind had I not gone mad already. The slime then began pushing its way between my lips. I held my mouth closed and covered my mouth tightly with both hands. The slime worked its way between my fingers and through my lips. I tried to crawl back as fast as I could manage, but I found my body again not responding to my demands. My eyes remained closed as my hands fell to my sides, not of my own volition. I was only in control of my mind, in which the creature had clearly gained access to as well. I felt as parts of its body oozed down my throat, ears up my nose, and down the tear ducts in my eyes. My insides burned as it worked its way down my body. I couldn't breathe at all. The panic and pain I felt in that moment I would not wish upon my worst enemy. Eventually, the pain began to subside. It no longer hurt, and I remember thinking that this is how I die. I have never been particularly afraid of death. Even when faced with it, I felt happy in a way. Happy to be at peace and drift away from this world. My body went limp, and I could see a light that grew closer. That moment was the most at peace I have ever felt. I next found myself in a state of complete non-existence. I'm not entirely sure how to describe the experience, or rather, lack of experience. I am aware of what happened entirely through hindsight, however in the moment I didn't even have a sense of self. I suppose what I experienced was, for lack of a better word, was pure nothingness. I truly ceased to exist. I was dead. The creature blessed me with the knowledge of what death really is. It's nothing. No matter what you believe, when death comes, we will each be thrown into non-existence, never to so much as even think again. I wonder if that knowledge will reinforce some people's nihilistic views of life, or if knowing that this is single life we all possess will give some people a newfound appreciation for the time they have. For me, this knowledge didn't matter much anymore. With the blessing of this being who occupied my body, I was able to comprehend the previously incomprehensible. I don't know how long I had been removed from existence. Obviously, time is no longer a concept when you don't exist to feel its passing. Reflecting on this moment sends pain through my head, like someone hitting the inside of my forehead with a hammer. It's knowledge no man should have. The momentary death I experience should be a blank spot in my mind, much like when you fall asleep and fail to dream. When I came to, I began to notice balls of light appearing in the darkness around me. I felt a chill shoot through me, as if I had just been thrown under the ice of a frozen lake. It took me a moment, but I soon realized that I was surrounded by stars. Behind me was the sun. It was unquestionably the sun. I was suspended in outer space. This moment is when I truly questioned my reality, truly questioned if I could trust my own mind anymore. I felt my lungs move as the creature breathed on my behalf. The skin on my body also now appeared to be the same grey slime of the creature's. With a faint glow from the thing I could now understand, my attention was directed to Earth. It was truly beautiful to see our planet like this, from this distance. Time appeared to be accelerated. I watched Earth slowly turn. I spotted England as it emerged from the dark side of the planet and drifted into the illumination of the sun. Seeing the planet like this is one of the greatest blessings that has ever been bestowed unto me. However, the experience does invoke a sense of utter worthlessness. 
Life and all our individual problems are all so meaningless. I could see everyone from up here, and not one person actually mattered. As time continued to accelerate and the Earth continued to spin, I watched as human life evolved, as technological advancements grew far beyond the boundaries of what I had ever imagined to be possible. I watched as vessels left Earth, as buildings appeared on the moon, shortly followed by buildings on Mars, too. Humanity continued to spread out in advance, to gain understanding and learn about the universe. For a moment, I was filled with joy. Joy simply to be human, and to be a part of this evolution. Until a great fire. A comet will strike the Earth. Explosives will be fired into it during its descent, but due to its size, our efforts to retaliate won't matter much. I watched as a wall of fire spat out in every direction from the impact zone. For centuries the earth will burn, fire will fill our atmosphere, but the earth will continue to turn. After the fire fades, the earth will be a mix of red and brown, uninhabitable to any form of life. The buildings on Mars and the moon will eventually fade and decay. All the work and pain we endured all led up to one random cosmic event, an event that will eradicate any evidence of humanity. Any and all progress we made as a species came to nothing, or rather, will come to nothing. With a jolt, I was pulled backwards. The Earth got smaller and smaller as I continued gaining speed. I watched the Earth until it was a brown dot in the distance, and then until I couldn't see it any longer. I was pulled past many planets, stars, moons, and suns, through many solar systems and galaxies. All empty. Life, as it turns out, even simple life, is an incredibly rare phenomenon. Humanity, at the end of it, as rare and as precious as is, was pointless. Our existence in the universe didn't matter to the universe itself. I can only imagine that life has tried on many planets, many times, only to be destroyed by events out of their control, or in terms of intelligent life, likely destroyed by their own doing. Life and everything that comes from it is the exception to the rule in our universe. The being who allowed me to this understanding, I can only imagine is part of a race who beat the odds who avoided total annihilation just long enough for the species to take to the stars and save themselves. I now understand that one day, not only will my individual existence be forgotten, but we all will. Any trace of human existence will eventually be wiped away. I woke on the sand, my mouth felt dry and my body weak. I can't say for sure how long I had been away from my body, Sitting up required immense effort, and my muscles burnt as I strained to sit upright in the sand. As I looked around, I noticed that I was lying just outside the opening that had previously pulled me in. However, the opening had collapsed and was now completely covered by sand. The archway was no longer visible. I looked around to find even the ruins had seemingly disappeared. However, the imprints where structures once stood remained in the sand, confirming to me I was still sane and that the experience was real. I looked up at the towering sand dunes around me and watched as the wind blew small dust clouds down into the pit I found myself in. Thomas's body lay not too far from me. I struggled to focus on him, but as my vision cleared, I noticed that he too was awake. He lay on his back eyes bloodshot and wide as he fixated on the midday sun above. I couldn't call to him. I tried, but my throat only managed a hoarse growl. He looked at me. If only for a second, in that second, I saw more pain in his eyes than I'd ever seen in any man before or since. I understood why, however, and watched as he returned his attention to the sun. Part 4. Enlightenment Reflecting on our return to England feels like trying to recall a dream. A dream that you're sure took place, however, the details of which are hard to recall. 
The trip took weeks, of course. After waking in the dunes, Thomas and I yet again began walking, not of our own volition. We walked for days through the desert, and though we could speak, we chose not to. Our bodies were sent back to Alexandria, after which we again boarded the HMS Hannibal and began our journey home. Not one word was uttered between Thomas and I during this time, nor since returning to Dartmouth. Thomas, in the following weeks after our return, I later discovered had committed suicide. I cannot blame him for his decision, given what he and I know, nor am I surprised by his actions, as I always knew he was a little weak-minded. I personally discovered Thomas' body. After roughly two weeks, I noticed his absence from the university. I was hoping to discuss matters with him, so visited his home in the country one night. He lived in a damp and overgrown little cottage, isolated deep within the English countryside. As I approached, I found the door to be wide open. No light escaped his home, however. I spotted the silhouette of his lower half dangling, limp through the doorway. He had hanged himself in the front room. Not the most pleasant way to go, by all accounts. In his bulging eyes, I saw an expression of undoubtable liberation. I pushed his corpse aside with one hand and walked past to investigate his desk, letting him swing a little behind me. He hadn't left a note. I assume he knew I'd be the one to find him. He knew I'd understand his decision. It was all too much for his mind to take. Confirmation of the soul being an idea of fiction finally gave him the assurance he needed to depart without fear of the afterlife. I left him there after discovering his fate. His death didn't matter much to me. I felt no need to give him a proper burial. The authorities will see to that upon discovering his body. Thomas now no longer exists, having left no impact on this world, nor the others he shared it with. Pitiful existence, really. Since returning to work, I have been utilizing my position at the university and the resources at my disposal to look into any rumors of particular hieroglyphs. I have been researching any ancient language or symbols that appear to be utterly unique, and so far I have found no further signs of these creatures. Within the archaeology community, I have been deemed a joke for suggesting the existence of these alien languages. Naturally, I have not disclosed the reasoning behind my research, as to keep at least part of my reputation intact. The original site of my encounter has since disappeared. I have no doubt that the beings I encountered are otherworldly. Most likely, from the reaches of the cosmos, humans will never hope to fathom. They appear to live on an entirely different plane of existence to us, one in which time is a construct they can move freely within. I intend to meet them again. There's so much more I can learn from them, so much more they can show me. With their power, their knowledge of the universe, they can help us, save us from our fate. I suspect now that the man who guided Thomas and I to that place was one of those creatures, or at the very least was himself guided by one of them. I suspect that from the moment I received the letter, that thing led my decisions, my movements. I often wonder how much of my free will was stripped from me, without me ever realizing. I do realize, however, that I brought this upon myself. All those sleepless nights praying for answers. Something in the dark heard me. Something in the dark answered me. I wonder if they still hear me. Even now. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.